Northampton City Council. My name is Ryan O'Donnell. I'm the council president, so I'll be presiding. Let me note that these proceedings are being audio and video recorded. And every council meeting begins with a period of public comment. It sound, looks like there's a number of people here today who may wish to provide public comment. You can speak on any issue you wish. There's just two rules that kind of facilitate this for everybody. Uh, the first is that we ask you to keep it to three minutes or less. Uh, if you hear somebody essentially say what you want to say, feel free to say me too, but the full three minutes is totally yours. And the other thing is we don't engage in a back and forth. It's, it's your time to give your thoughts uh, to us, but if you need to follow up with any of your uh, counselors individually afterwards, you're of course encouraged to do that. So I will start with a sign-up sheet, and after I've exhausted it, I'll just ask if anyone who hasn't signed up would like to speak. Okay. So the first person I have is Adele Franks. Ms. Franks, if you would uh, give your name and address for the record, and the floor is yours. My name is Adele Franks. I live in Florence. And I am here tonight to speak on behalf of the resolution opposing the expansion of gas <coughs> structure in our region. I'm uh, wearing my public health hat tonight, and I'd like to point out that although we've all been taught that natural gas is natural and clean and safe, we're actually learning more and more that none of these things is actually true. In fact, from every stage, from blasting it out of rock with toxic chemicals to the flaring of methane at the wells to transporting the gas in leaking pipelines to burning the gas in our homes and businesses and power plants, the, uh, it's harmful to public health. And although pipeline explosions have a very long history, even before the Merrimack Valley tragedy, we've only relatively recently become aware that methane, which is the main component of natural gas, is a very potent greenhouse gas, even more potent than carbon dioxide. And so as we uh, leak methane into the atmosphere, we are harming, harming our climate. We also now know that other chemicals that are in natural gas both before and after it is burned, such as nitrogen dioxide, benzene, formaldehyde, hexane, chromium, and lead, are hazardous to human health, and they are released into our air and harm everyone who, in fact, breathes the air. And even more recently, we have learned that similar to the old story about the canary in the coal mine, children who live in homes that use gas stoves for cooking suffer an undue burden of respiratory problems. So that is why people have taken to using the slogan, gas is the past. And I am proud to live in Northampton, where we've made a commitment to transition as rapidly as possible to clean, renewable energy, and to avoid taking actions that increase the burning of fossil fuels. And so the re approving the resolution that you have before you tonight will demonstrate that we really mean what we say, and that even though Columbia Gas has held our city hostage with its trumped up moratorium. We're not going to fall for its strong arm tactics, and instead we will oppose its call for an expansion of um, capacity in our area. So I urge you to approve the resolution tonight, and I thank you for your time. I have left a handout on, um, at all of your places that gives a bit more information about some of the things that I mentioned. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. The next person I have signed up is Marty Nathan. Hi, I'm Marty Nathan, 24 Massasoit Street. Oops. What have I done? Thank you. Forgive me, I'm not ready. Okay, now I am. Thanks for hearing us. Um, I wanted to tell you a story because last night I could not fall asleep. I had made the mistake of looking at my phone news feed from the Washington Post about researchers looking at a very strange lake in western Alaska that has been found to be bubbling like a cauldron. 
the researchers who are specialists in Ar Arctic lakes found that it was spewing methane, natural gas, from a deposit deep underneath. The deposit had been uncapped by the melting of the permafrost over it from climate change. Rising global temperatures, particularly at the poles, uh, raising global, uh, with, from rising global temperatures, particularly at the poles, from the ever-growing blanket wrapped around our planet consisting of greenhouse gases. Scientists have talked for years about the melting of the tundra and the release of the carbon dioxide and the methane in it. It is one of those tipping points or feedback loops that climate scientists have predicted for years. The burning of fossil fuel warms the planet enough that it provokes geophysical processes that carry on independent of what we human beings are doing, producing more greenhouse gases that amplify the, warning, the warming. This example was especially terrifying because of the scale of the emissions from deep in the earth, not just from the melting tundra. The research, researchers didn't know if this was a one-off affair or if wells of gas lurk under many of the newly created Arctic lakes all over the north. I tell this story because this describes climate emergency. The polar ice melting not only raises sea levels, but allows more absorption of the sun's rays to the now dark surface, raising temperatures further. Our now acidified oceans are becoming less and less able to absorb CO2 as more, uh, they become more acid. Fires burn the trees that form the other carbon sink in our world. We must stop burning fossil fuels now, yesterday. We must stop leaking methane now, yesterday. There are no adults in power in Washington, D.C., and very few in Boston that are doing the job that really is an international undertaking. But we have our community, which is led by quite a few smart, caring, and courageous folks. And we are here to rely on you. Please unanimously pass the resolution opposing the expansion of gas infrastructure and calling for <coughs> increased development and implementation of renewable and clean energy sources. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next, I'd like to invite Molly Hale. Hello. Thank you for hearing us. I live at 96 Oak Street in Florence. Um, I'm also speaking about the pipeline resolution. Um, I feel strongly that um, Columbia Gas should fix all the existing gas leaks and also leak prone pipes that are rusty and prone to corrosion before building any new pipelines. Um, throughout Northampton and the whole Commonwealth, there are many leaks that have not been deemed hazardous enough by Columbia Gas to even warrant a timetable for repair. And yet, a 2015 Department of Public Utilities report stated that leaky pipes caused 2.7% of the gas to be lost, and that these leaks account for 10% of Massachusetts' total greenhouse gas emissions. Um, this is methane that Marty was talking about. That's what's coming out of these pipes. Um, we are in a climate emergency, seriously. And from that standpoint alone, we must find alternatives to building more infrastructure that locks in increases of fossil fuel use where we need to actually be cutting it way, 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 way back. Um, it locks it in for decades to come. Um, fixing the leaks is a good place to start. And I urge you to vote in favor of opposing the pipeline. Thank you very much. Rena Pai. Hi, good evening. I'm Rena Pai. I live at 60 Crescent Street in Northampton. And my main reason for being here is because I think it's critical we use less fossil fuels and more renewable energy. But right now, I want to talk about a very specific corollary issue, 
We all know that scores of homes were destroyed by gas explosions in the eastern part of the state. We heard that it was something to do with high pressure and low pressure lines, but the details of this were not clear to me. Uh, I assume this meant something to do with the major arteries of the delivery system. I recently learned something different. A couple of days ago, Columbia Gas was at my house to mark the lines for some planned excavation I'm having done. I asked the representative how I would turn off the gas if I were ever concerned about leaking gas in my house. The Columbia Gas representative informed me that I do not need to worry. He showed me that I have a high pressure line and a regulator outside, and he did show me how to turn it off. But then he told me that the homes that exploded recently had low pressure lines without a regulator. Therefore, it appears that some dwellings in Massachusetts have high pressure lines with regulators, while in others, gas is supplied via low pressure lines with no regulator. Why is it that Columbia Gas is allowed to use equipment which is significantly less safe? We need to know more about this. Do all Columbia Gas customers in Northampton have high pressure lines with regulators? If not, rather than using our ratepayer dollars to build new pipelines, let us first uniformly assure safety of the existing systems. And of course, we must continue to plug up all the gas leaks. Someone has already spoken about that, which are a source of waste and which emit methane, which as we know is a more potent greenhouse gas than CO2. So we saw with the explosions in Lawrence that there were no warning signs before the gas lines blew up. We need to make sure that explosions like this don't happen again, whether here or anywhere else in our country. And it seems to me the best place for our community to start is to make sure that we have the proper, safest gas connections rather than trying to expand the delivery infrastructure for a need that Columbia Gas still hasn't proven and which would certainly be better served with <coughs> renewable energy. So conclusion, instead of subjecting ratepayers to higher costs to build a pipeline we don't need, let's make sure we have safe equipment right now. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pye. Um, Alex McKinley is next. Hi, I'm Alex McKinley. Um, I live in Northampton. I'm a sophomore at Smith College. Um, as a young person, converting to clean energy and becoming energy efficient is extremely important to me. After decades of irresponsible fossil fuel use, the effects of climate change are obvious. Um, from ever-increasing death counts, from natural disasters every year, to one in four children in Holyoke being diagnosed with asthma, um, climate change affects all of us. However, my generation will bear the brunt of policies that allow fossil fuels to endanger our communities. As my generation inherits the earth, we will also inherit the climate change disaster that, if we don't convert to clean energy, will soon be irreversible. I urge you all to stop prioritizing short-term economic interests over my health, safety, and well-being, and that of all future generations. Therefore, I ask that the city and Columbia Gas support the conversion to clean, <coughs> sustainable energy rather than building new pipelines, not just for yourselves, but for those who will be affected by it the most, your children, your grandchildren, and your great-grandchildren. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next is Irvine Silver. Irvine. Thank you. My name is Irvine Sobelman, and I live at 116 Laurel Park. And I stand, surprisingly, for the resolution opposing new fossil fuel infrastructure. I believe that in this time of climate emergency, we have a responsibility to act for the protection of our community in every sense of that word. The community of Northampton, the surrounding towns and cities, our state, our nation, and indeed the entire planet because we are a community that shares the atmosphere, the soil, and the water of our Earth. And to act responsibly, we must have accurate information about the problems we face and the options that are available to us. So I commend you for including in, in the resolution a call for transparency. The city of Northampton has been clear in its intention to reduce our dependence on fossil fuel and has been acting on that intention by promoting energy efficiency, conservation, and conversion from fossil fuels to renewable energy technologies. Even so, Northampton is being used as the justification for a proposal to build additional pipelines in neighboring communities. 
So on what data is Columbia Gas basing its claim that we need or want more gas in our city? They say we need an increase in gas capacity of 2.2% every year. If we're to live up to our stated intention and our moral responsibility at this moment in history, we don't want ongoing increases in our gas use. We want and need to use less. So where is this data from Columbia Gas? We expect there have been decreases in demand. We know, for instance, that Smith College has reduced their gas usage significantly in the past few years. And Northampton has made advances through the Solarize program, Heat Smart, and Button Up. What improvements in the supply and demand equation have resulted from gas leak repairs? We don't know. But the truth is, if we aren't doing as well as we want to be, we need that data so that we can up our game. Now, we understand that we are not getting off of all fossil fuels this week or even this year, but what we do want is to be moving in that direction. So in that regard, it would make sense to allow exceptions to the coercive Columbia Gas moratorium on new and expanded gas hookups. Let's have a reasonable conversation about where we can cut back and where we might continue gas use in specific applications for which there isn't a good alternative available yet. And a reasonable conversation requires transparency from Columbia Gas. Thank you for demanding that transparency in this resolution and for standing up with and for our community. Thank you, Ms. Sobelman. Um, next, uh, Susan Tiberich, please. We can. Oh, okay, great. Sorry, first time, I just moved to uh, Northampton from Amherst. And I want to say, first of all, I want to commend you on the incredible environmental regulations you have around. We're building a house, and I'm just so impressed. I'm getting to see up close, and I think it's amazing the attention you pay. So you've done a great job. Thank you. Uh, and I just want to say briefly, I spent the afternoon in Holyoke f with a number of people from Holyoke who were out on the street saying they do not want this Columbia Gas Pipeline built. Folks in Springfield are organizing against it, Longmeadow, West Springfield. Um, this, this resolution, which I'm strongly in favor of, is a real support to communities that are desperately fighting. And I mean, one of our chants was about, you know, we don't, you know, look, look what happened in Lawrence. We don't want that happening here. People are terrified. So I, I strongly support the resolution. And I'm honored to live in a town where you all really take, take care of things. So thank you. We're happy to have you, too. Thank you. Uh, I meant that sincerely. Um, and we're also happy to have Lily Lombard. Hi, I'm Lily Lombard. I live at 39 Monroe Street. I'm also speaking in support of the resolution to oppose the expansion of the Columbia Gas Pipeline. Um, I'll take this opportunity to ask members of the public to stand who are also in support of this resolution for those who are not going to be making a public comment. Okay, there you have it. Great. Um, I want to uh, I want to echo uh, what everyone else said, and I also want to piggyback specifically on I, um, Irvine's comments about questioning the um, the need for expansion of gas in our region. I want to provide a personal testimony, and that is that I, I, I'm part of a moderate income family of four. Um, uh, I learned that there was an opportunity to install solar hot water panels on my um, house with, the, um, with numerous incentives from the state and at the federal level, too. Um, we qualified, we were evaluated, and it is costing our family of four for um, two large panels, uh, the tank, the installation, all the permitting, $683. So, and that is gonna reduce our hot water demand for natural gas by 80%. And that's just, that's just hot water. So that's w one way in which people can be taking advantage right now of the opportunity to um, move from natural gas to clean energy. Um, I also just found out that we qualified for the solar access program, which is another incentive to install um, photovoltaic panels on our house um, that would also include the, um, the installation of a mini split um, <coughs> system that is completely off of natural gas. So there are opportunities available all the time for people to make that conversion and going forward, 
into the 21st century, there is going to be less and less demand for natural gas, as there should be. So I, um, I don't buy this justification for an expansion. I think it's bogus. I think it's based in 20th century data. And we are moving forward into a renewable energy future. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Paul Whit um, Whitridge? Forgive me if I mispronounce your name. <coughs> Maybe you can tell us your name and your address. Yeah, that's right. My name is Paul Whitridge. Um, I live at 56 Crescent Street. Grew up here, born here. Um, I just wanted to add to all the great things that everybody said so far that if we were to build a new pipeline, I think it would become what's called a stranded asset, which is a large capital investment that can never pay for itself because the economics change during the course of its lifetime. So I think the value of natural gas is going to continue to decrease rapidly as it has been because renewable energy is also decreasing in cost. So renewable energy technology, specifically solar technology, um, solar photovoltaics, is on just an incredible cost curve right now. The costs have decreased almost tenfold over the last decade, and they will likely continue to fall. So we have a choice now to either build new renewable energy electricity infrastructure or to build this new gas infrastructure. And if we build gas infrastructure that never pays for itself, that the gas company can never make a profit from, we will inevitably be paying to remove it when we don't want it anymore. So folks here have already made great points about why gas is bad, I agree. Why it's harmful to our health, I agree. And why we have great alternatives. Lily just enumerated those alternatives very clearly. Um, I just also want to point out, if we build something now, we'll be footing the bill for a uh, cost we didn't want in the first place, shorter than we think, and we're going to be paying twice for something that we never really wanted. So please oppose a pipeline and approve this measure. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Um, Sharon Bolton. I'm Sharon Moulton, 48 Evergreen Road, number 313 in Ward 7B. And I'm also speaking um, in favor of the resolution in opposition to the so-called Columbia Gas Reliability Project. And I'm here to give, uh, I'm a member of the Climate Action Now working group called SWAP. Um, succeeding, I uh, forget exactly. It used to be <laughs> staying warm without additional pipelines. It's now like success without additional pipelines. Or, but, but anyway, we've been working with some counselors on this um, resolution. And in, I want to thank those counselors. And I also want to thank you for adding recognition of the C Columbia gas pipeline explosions in the Merrimack uh, Valley to the resolution that we talked about. And thanks for supporting uh, the demands of our senators and our attorney general. And thanks for highlighting the necessity for a complete and transparent investigation of the events and Columbia Gas's responses to those events, an understanding of why the disaster took place and how to ensure that nothing similar can ever happen again must happen before any gas infrastructure is replaced, expanded, or allowed to change what it's currently doing in any way. The Merrimack Valley tragedy is a stark reminder that in this time of climate emergency, facilitate, facilitating the rapid transition away from fossil fuels is imperative. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Peter Ives, Reverend Ives. Peter Ives, uh, 15 Dryage Green. Uh, this morning on the Reverend the Rabbi, um, we had Dr. Marty Nathan um, uh, talking with us uh, about climate change. He was also talking about Archie Markham and celebrating Archie's life at the First Churches this Sunday. But what struck me about Marty and Dr. Marty Nathan and what she was saying is her sense of <coughs> urgency, real sense of urgency. Uh, M Marty will say that we only have until 235 to make all of these transitions and transformations 
before we lose control of the Earth as we know it. 2035. Count the years. That's only 17 years. 17 years. So we're quibbling about how to, you know, make all these things work right now, and you're going to be pondering about how to make all these things work. But think about it. Think about your children and your grandchildren. We only have, and I believe, Marty, uh, 17 years before our Earth, as we know it, spins out of control. And I take that home uh, with me every night. And I thank Marty Nathan, Dr. Marty Nathan, for her sense of urgency. And I urge you as city councilors to have that sense of urgency as you talk about these issues now. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Uh, Suzanne Love. <coughs> yeah. Hi, I'm Suzanne Love, and I live on 109 Ryan Road. And I'm here tonight as a nurse. I work in the emergency department at Bay State Franklin Medical Center. And I'm here to ask for all of you here tonight and in the audience behind me and watching on TV to please vote yes on question one. This will allow for a safe level of patience for a nurse to have at one time. This is for registered nurses who work in the hospital. We believe that the best way that patients get care is to have the right amount of nursing attention. That's why patients are in the hospital, is because they need a nurse who can care for them at the level of care that's necessary. Patients who are hospitalized at this point really need a lot of care. It's the sickest of the sick who are admitted to the hospital. There is enough money to be able to hire the nurses to provide the care that's necessary. So please consider the people who are in your in the care in the hospital if you were if you or your mom or your grandmother or your child was pushing the call bell at 3 a.m you would want a nurse to come to respond to that need for help do you have to go to the bathroom do you need some pain medication are you scared what do you need you'd want a nurse to be able to be there to help with that concern so thank you thank you <laughs> so the next name i have is um I'll just read the last name. I can't make out the first. Silva. Forgive me for not reading the first word, but the floor is yours. My name is Errol, and I live on 48 Marshall Street in Northampton. I'm standing in front of you tonight as a nurse and as an American citizen to ask you to vote yes <coughs> on question one. Becoming a nurse was realizing that the American dream was possible. While going to school to pursue my second bachelor degree in this country, I support myself financially by being a nursing assistant. I came to this country alone with no family member. It wasn't easy to achieve my American dream of becoming a nurse. Where I work now, in an acute rehab center specialized in brain trauma and stroke, I am responsible for 10 patients on a daily basis. When the hospital census is kind of low, our load someday increased to 12 patients. And when a nurse called out sick and the hospital can't find a nurse to replace she or he, we have no contract with an outside agency because our administration state that the hospital can afford it. We are obliged to take our nurses, friends, with, uh, take our nurse, friends, patients, increase to a ratio of one to 15. We're tired of being taken advantage of, being coerced into the name of our profession. We're tired of not being able to take breaks to even use the toilet. My colleagues and I sometimes joke to see who went for the longest time <laughs> without peeing. This is not a joke. This is our reality. We're not angels with superpower. We are human beings with a physical body. Today, we nurses are dealing with serious health issues that could be prevented, such as hypertension, 
back pain, arthritis, obesity, and mental health illnesses. We are tired of jumping from one hospital to the next, hoping that it's going to be better at the other hospital. I believe in the American dream, that through hard work and commitment to what I do, I'll be able to support myself and my family financially by being a nurse. I'm afraid that if question one doesn't get vote into legislation, I will not be able to carry on with my job. If that continues, the ratio of one to 10 or one to 12 or sometimes 15, I am afraid that my American dream, it's becoming my American nightmare. But I'm very hopeful, I am a nurse, I'm hopeful that my patients will get the care they need by increasing nursing staff in the hospital of our beloved Massachusetts. <coughs> thank you for your time, attention, and thank you for your supporting, supporting by voting yes to question one. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to say that for the reasons stated, I oppose pipelines bringing new fracked gas to our region, and it's been stated eloquently. Thank you, Bill. Um, we appreciate all those comments from those who have signed up. Are there any who haven't spoken who wish, who wish, would wish to speak? Sarah? Hi, I'm Sarah Field. I live at 40 Elizabeth Street in Ward 3 in Northampton, um, and I'm here well, supporting, yes, on question one, definitely, but also um, supporting the resolution um, regarding the natural gas pipeline. And I want to thank the counselors that um, put the resolution forth and all of the people who have been organizing against the pipeline. Um, one comment here really brought up a, a question for me. I, I think that as, you know, as a city, I really appreciate the moves that we're making to move towards um, alternative sources of energy and energy efficiency in general, but almost half of the people who live in Northampton are renters, right? And renters tend to pay their gas bills, um, but are not necessarily in control of the efficiency of their buildings or of the energy sources of those buildings. So as we think together, I, I hope that you will all vote unanimously to oppose this pipeline, but as we think together about really um, moving towards being a model of an energy efficient city that can move away from natural gas, that's one thing that I would love for you all to look at is what kinds of policies can we put in place that will actually incentivize all of the buildings in Northampton to be um, more energy efficient and to be using alternative energy sources when the people who are living there and who are paying for it are not necessarily the people who are um, able to make decisions about that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Would anyone else like to provide public comment on anything? Ms. Voss? Um, my name is Susan Voss. I live at 89 Ridgewood Terrace. And I want to thank everybody who's worked so hard on this resolution. I mm -hmm. urge you all to support it. Um, I teach engineering at Smith College. Mm -hmm. I work on hearing. But over the last 10 years, I've really transitioned to teaching a class about energy and the environment because of this very issue. In fact, right now I'm teaching 21 students about this. And the conversations we having, are having are amazing. And it's great to hear a young person who's not in my class speak about it because <laughs> um, it really echoes what I'm hearing. And that is our generation, above the people older than these students, our kids, our, these younger people haven't done this. And we're leaving a really big mess behind. And we need, as people have already said very eloquently, to clean it up and not build infrastructure that is just going to make things worse, that we're going to pay for. Our fees are going to, the Columbia's gas pipeline is going to get paid for by gas users, renters included, their, their fees are going to go up. Um, and on the other side of things, the science is so clear, and I don't know that we even have 17 years. I think every time I read about this, it seems like it's getting closer and closer, and we're seeing in the news every day. Ten years ago, we'd say, oh, that's just weather. It's not climate change. But if you look around the news the last couple of years, it's pretty clear there's climate change going, around, going on. Um, Small nations by the equator are almost underwater. We don't see it all here in Northampton, but as a group that really has high standards and ethics, I think we need to recognize that we, you, you all can help be a leader. I'm really proud of this city. 
um, for taking the stand and leading the way as opposed to many of our leaders in this country. So this meeting is a highlight for me this week and I thank you for all the work you're doing. Thank you. <clears throat> what else? Elliot, please. Hi, Elliot Fratkin, 24 Massasoit Street. The fossil fuel companies are the wealthiest companies in the world. They're the most profitable com companies in the world. They don't want to lose any of that profit. And they want to make sure that we continue to use fossil fuels as long as possible. That's why shutting down this pipeline is so important, because if you build this, it almost guarantees 30 years of more gas use, frack gas at that. And so why should we put our energy, so to speak, into prolonging that when we need to work on the state house and the federal government, if possible, to reduce the costs, which have been coming down anyway, of non-fossil fuel energy? Um, it's very possible, I think, a lot of expertise in this room, and you've talked to a lot of the experts, too, about why this is not only feasible, it's, it's absolutely necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Sir, please. So, uh, thank you all for doing this. I know these are late nights. And uh, uh, my name is Paul Voss. I'm at 89 Ridgewood Terrace. And I, I can say that um, early 2000s, we actually retrofitted our home with uh, solar energy on the roof and uh, photovoltaics. And it's, it's, it was really made a tremendous difference in reducing um, our gas bills and our electric bills and has continued to work for almost 20 years now and, and, and just as well as on the day we installed it. So um, the technology is, one of the great hopes is that the technology is moving in a way that the costs are coming down and these systems are exponentially, especially the photovoltaics, exponentially cheaper. Uh, and and actually giving gas and oil a real run for the money. But I think what you're doing here is supporting that and doing what you can to push it in the right direction. Um, and uh, I will say I teach atmospheric science course. I, I did my graduate work in a lab that actually made the first measurements in the ozone layer. Of, um, and so I'm very aware of the physics of this stuff. And it's very real. It's very scary. I, I share the view uh, that it's, I don't know if I share it's a climate emergency. That ship may have sailed 20 years ago. Uh, we may be in for a real ride. And, uh, but the things that we do now can slow it down and can maybe make it a better, a little better world for our children. And uh, it's not their grandchildren. It's the children that we're concerned about. So uh, thank you for what you're doing. Yep. Thank you. Anyone else? No, no one else wants to speak? This group doesn't strike me as shy. I wouldn't use that word to describe most of the people here. Sure, Eric, please. Uh, it doesn't pertain directly to the pipeline, but to recycling and the environment. I think we've mentioned, and everybody's uh, concurrent and agrees that recycling is necessary. Um, nothing personal to mention. Coke and Sprite, I believe, recycle in Arizona. I think everybody in the state is aware it doesn't recycle in Massachusetts yet. I'm really not sure why. Um, we did some things with Reitberg um, for the recycling bill on the Lemon Law in the 80s, and if it needs legislation, I'm, I'm not really sure. I googled Arizona and Elizabeth Warren's staff and got a general note back about the environment. I personally don't believe that cans really pollute the environment because it comes from there, but um, recycling is simply efficient and expedient. I think we all agree, so if we can sort of keep that on the agenda for Arizona and Adjunctly, Pearl Harbor comes up. There's a battleship, Arizona, correct? So, in memory of Pearl Harbor, too. Okay. Thank Thanks. you, Eric. Thank you. Sure. Anyone else? Um, if no other uh, members of the public want to provide public <coughs> comment, we'll convene. Thank you, everyone, for your, your comments. And so I'll ask for a roll of the City Council to go into session. Council, Here. Present. Here. Here. Present. Here. 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 Okay. Uh, we have a couple of public hearings. I'd ask <clears throat> anyone who's leaving to subdue their conversations as they leave. Okay, it's optional. Uh, the, the first public hearing, ladies and gentlemen, can I ask you to subdue your conversations, please? Thank you. It just helps us go through uh, the kind of routine business we have here. Uh, the first is 18140 National Grid and Verizon New England Poll Petition 
for North Main Street um, in Leeds. Um, and so I would ask for a motion to open a public hearing on this match. Made Second. by Councilor Bard, seconded by Councilor Shera. All those in favor of opening the hearing, please say aye. 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 Opposed, so the hearing is open. Um, are there any proponents of this petition to start? Lisa. Hello. Hello. Lisa Jasinski with National Grid. Good evening to everybody. Um, the poll petition that we're uh, referring to is really for a job for the VA Medical Center. Right now they have a fee that goes into the medical center. They're going to be revamping the whole system and making it a little bit more reliable. They have a couple polls that are right next to each other. It's not the greatest situation, but so while they're going to uh, put this work into it, we're just going to separate them a little bit. In the event of an accident or a, you know something with a poll, they have kind of a backup. So two poles right across from, it's not the main entrance, but it's kind of like their service entrance off of North Main Street. Um, we're separating those uh, a little bit, and then two poles directly across the street will feed into the VA, as opposed to the way it's fed now. Great, thank you. Any, any questions? Um, is there anyone else who'd like to speak on this? Opponents or any comments at all from anybody? No? Move okay. to close the public hearing. Is there a second? Yes. second. All in favor of closing the hearing, please say aye. 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 Closed. Hearing is closed. Um, another hearing is 18143. Uh, again, National Grid Verizon New England poll petition for Audubon Road. Is there a motion to open this hearing? Second. Uh, made by Councilor Barge, seconded by Councilor Dwight, I believe. Um, so please, uh, Mr. Jasinski. Okay, uh, this this uh, poll that we're requesting, years ago, what we did is we used to guide construction, existing construction to trees, just as anybody would put a cable in a tree to hold it together. But it's been holding some of our our um, existing construction when those trees have lived their lives and it's time for them to come down we try to replace them with what we call our stub poles. It's really just a means for support, not not for um, power. Um, questions, Councillor Klein. Um, I represent Ward 7 where Audubon Road is mm -hmm. and um, have been in conversation with the people who live in the house um, immediately adjacent to this area, 371 Audubon Road. Um, their concern was about, and I called you and didn't hear back from you because I was hoping to get this information before the hearing so we didn't have to do this here, but um, they're concerned about the, the wires that will come out of this pole. Yep. Um, my, uh, their understanding and my understanding is that the, the tree that's being taken down is a pine tree that's sickly because yes. it got sick in the last yes. uh, winter, last winter storms. Mm -hmm. um, but they have a number of trees. There are some shagbark el uh, hickories and a whole line of disease-resistant elms that they actually planted that they're worried about um, new wires going through those trees and affecting the growth of the trees. So they wanted to know if that had been considered. So uh, they're, they're not concerned about the poll that we're proposing, correct? They're concerned about the pull, the, the wire from across the street to this new pole? Um, I think they're, they're more, they're asking what, kind, what direction are they going to be lateral, the wires that come out of this pole, and will it affect the trees that are on the same side that the pole is being erected? It, it shouldn't. I mean, when that pole comes out, the pole, um, when the tree comes out, the pole's going to sit really pretty much where that tree is now. And then from that pole directly across the street to the um, to the existing pole is the is the support wire, and then from that pole it just goes down at a very sh shallow angle to give it support and and into the ground, and can even be done with what we call sidewalk hardware, so it doesn't go down at an angle, but it comes down off the pole at an angle and then straight into the ground. And but I can reach out to 371 too and just make sure I have a conversation with them about that. So. I didn't. I'm sorry. I didn't receive your message. I'm not sure when you sent when you left. Yeah. Yeah. And Lisa, this pole you're putting in yeah. is just to support another pole. There's Correct. no electric wires on the pole. Correct. There's just a wire, guy wire, to hold Correct. the other pole up. Correct. So there's no electricity on the pole. If I could just sure kind of finish that up. If you could reach out to them, and I can give you email addresses if that's useful or a phone number. Um, okay. It would be really okay help them. Okay. Um, yeah. That's fine. 
I'll be able to I'll be able to just grab your email and I'll send you one to give you my information. How was that? that sounds okay. Good. Anything else from the council? Councilor Dwight. Just uh, on that line, I assume there there's no petition here for expanded service on that line, and there's no so you're simply just putting in a guy wire. And there's no as as Councilor Murphy said, mm -hmm. there's no expanded service. There's no modification of service currently, and nothing planned for that. Uh, no, I will say this: that if somebody ever bought, purchased the property, like um, if the, if the pole is sitting right here on the side of the street, and there's a lot of land, and somebody's going to build right. in this lot of land, we would then just run a secondary cable over to it to provide electric service. But it's it's a big field right now, and there's no intention of that at this time. Right. So and it, yeah. So this petition does not address any looming issue like expanded service expanded lines off there is so. there is there is no intention of that although i believe that once the petition just to be clear once that is once the pole is in the ground we do have the permission to add a we just don't have any reason for right. it other than this and, and, and it would be a new home that is given a building permit exactly and all that and and the fact is that that um the the circumstances wouldn't change even if you didn't put in this, I mean, if if we're still guide to that tree, that same potential for development across the street still exists. So it's not, so it's not necessarily germane to what we're talking about here. Correct. Great. Any other comments or questions from the city council? If is there anyone else who would like to comment on this, a member of the public, or against or neutral? Okay. Hearing none. Is there a motion to close this hearing? It's a motion. <clears throat> made and seconded. All those in favor closing the hearing, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? So the hearing is closed. This will appear on our consent agenda Great. shortly. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very and much. And I'll be in touch with you all. Great. Thank you. Um, I have no updates. Do any uh, councilors have updates? Or one minute announcements? Councilor DeBarge. Yes. Um, I just want to um, announce the. Um, there's a youth fishing program, Cops and Bobbers, Hooks and Ladders, Saturday, November 27, 2018, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., and the registration begins at 9.30. Willow Pond at Look Park, Northampton, Mass. Children ages 14 and under must be supervised by an adult. It's a free program designed to teach youth ages 14 and under to fish, connect, with the outdoors and develop positive relationships with law enforcement and safety officials in their communities. Loan of fishing equipment is available on site and bait will be provided. And every child will be entered into a raffle to win fishing related prizes. Thank you, Councillor. Other other oh. Councillor Nash and sure. So uh, I'd like to announce that uh, this Sunday, uh, October 7th, uh, that uh, Cutchins programs for children and families on Pomeroy Terrace will be having their uh, sur superhero walk and run. Um, so there's a 5K walk run, and there's also a 10K run, which is actually doing the 5K twice, um, and that um, that. It's in Ward 3, it'll be running around Ward 3 and uh, finish up coming down the dike and, um, and people are encouraged to come over and participate. There's gonna be face painting, there's gonna be a costume contest, people are gonna be dressing up as part of the race. Uh, there's gonna be a DJ and a raffle and um, so feel free to come over and join the fun. Thank you. Council for Ward 5. Um, Saturday, October 13th, which is a week from this Saturday, from 2 to 5 p.m., Northampton Rotary is having a chowder and wine festival at the Glendale Ridge Vineyard in Southampton. Uh, there's a $10 donation, and the proceeds benefit Grow Food Northampton and Northampton Dollars for Scholars. Excellent. Anything else? Other updates? Okay. Um, Mr. Mayor, do you have any communications? or? Uh, just one to remind counselors and members of the public that on Monday, October 8th, is the annual uh, Pulaski Day uh, celebration, and the annual Pulaski Day parade will step off at 11 a.m. from the, uh, well, depending on your generation, either Blyda Ford or Northampton Honda lot on King Street, <laughs> 
and uh, we'll proceed uh, to Main Street and to Pulaski Park, and there will be ceremonies to follow. Um, this year's parade marshals, co-parade marshals, are um, retiring uh, state representatives Steve Kulik and John Scheibeck. So hope uh, to see folks there. It's, the weather's supposed to be really nice. So thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, let's see. Any objection to taking the consent agenda? Next. Uh, hearing none, the consent agenda contains these items. Uh, first, the minutes, and if you want to remove any of them, tell me and we'll remove them and vote them separately. Uh, the minutes of September 20th, 2018, the approval of a poll petition from National Grid Verizon New England for North Main Street in Leeds, uh, the approval of a similar petition uh, for Audubon Road, uh, and various appointments which have all received positive recommendations from the Committee on City Services. Uh, those are to the Agricultural Commission, Richard Jasky of 774 Bridge Road, to the Public Shade Tree Commission, Susan Lofthouse of 15 Stoddard Street, to the Energy and Sustainability Commission, Aidan uh, Maynard of 12 Perkins Avenue, and to the Transportation and Parking Commission, Devin Bruce of 46 Columbus Avenue. No, Check any removals? Then we have a motion to approve. Second. And seconded by Councillor Dwight. Uh, no discussion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any abstentions? So the consent agenda is approved. Um, and now we will move um, to resolutions. Um, I have two copies, so educate me on which is the, the most recent one. Um, I'll ask our administrative system if she knows. Maybe. Right. There's there's a proposed amended version that's already ah. so the the original document should probably be introduced and then we'll have the opportunity and to add the amendments. the amendments. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. So I will. That will be the top one. It looks yeah, like. This is the second one. Is the this is the first. It just. The this is the second. Highlights one. is. It adds the. Uh, it highlights adds, amendments. It adds the uh, stuff good. from Merrimack Valley. So thank you very much. So here we go. So in in. Uh, in the City Council, October 4th, 2018, upon the recommendation of Councillor William H. Dwight, Councillor Elisa F. Klein, and the Northampton Sustainability and Energy Commission, um, also known as the Northampton Energy and Sustainability Commission, perhaps. Um, uh, 18170, a resolution opposing the expansion of gas infrastructure and calling for increased development and implementation of renewable and clean energy sources. Whereas we are in a climate emergency facing rising temperatures, droughts, massive storms, forest fires, and rising seas, in which the extraction, processing, transport, and burning of fossil fuels not only plays an enormous role, but pollutes our air by releasing noxious substances that may cause many harmful and life-threatening medical conditions such as asthma, COPD, cardiovascular disease, and poor pregnancy outcomes. And whereas in its January uh, 4th, 2018, resolution in support of 100% renewable energy, the Northampton City Council recognized the dangerous outcomes of climate change and called for a rapid attainment of a goal of 100% clean renewable energy for the state of Massachusetts and the city of Northampton. And in that same resolution, pledged to avoid taking actions that could increase the use of fossil fuels or delay the transition to 100% renewable energy. And whereas in its June 4th, 2015, resolution calling for transparency and public representation regarding natural gas infrastructure, the Northam City Council cited data that suggests that repairing existing pipelines will eliminate the need uh, for the installation of any new pipeline infrastructure and calls on gas companies not to build new pipelines, but rather to repair the current pipeline <laughs> infrastructure to eliminate the leakage of natural gas and in doing so, reduce the health, safety, and environmental dangers associated with gas leaks. And whereas public pressure compelled Columbia Gas to identify and fix large methane leaks in its distribution area, yet the company continues to claim capacity shortage issues in the Northampton lateral pipeline on peak days, thus justifying the launch of what it is calling a, quote, reliability project. The building, at a cost of $24 million to Columbia Gas Ratepayers, of a new six-mile, 12-inch alternative backfeed pipeline through the city of West Springfield. Whereas City Council's June 4th, 
2015 resolution calling for transparency and public representation regarding natural gas infrastructure called on Columbia Gas to uh, embrace complete transparency and make, all, and make public all engineering and financial information substantiating the claim that the Northampton Lateral is at capacity, but this information has never been shared with, the Northampton, uh, with Northampton city officials. And whereas in response to Columbia Gas, Gas's longstanding moratorium on new gas service installations, Northampton and surrounding communities have aggressively pursued green energy modalities, including energy retrofits, solar energy generation, air sourced heat pumps, and methane capture, the use of which has reduced our dependency on natural gas while conforming to the goal of using only 100% renewable alternatives to provide our energy. And whereas Northampton and its neighbors are on a successful course of establishing a sustainable energy infrastructure that does not rely mm -hmm. on fossil fuels, thus significantly reducing the demand for natural gas and challenging the stated need for expanded <clears throat> gas pipeline infrastructure. And whereas increasing natural gas supply to Northampton would slow and possibly have adverse effects on the progress of our community's commitments to realizing a 100% renewable energy goal, now therefore be resolved that the City Council of Northampton opposes the building of additional infrastructure that will expand the capacity of gas delivery to the area under the pretense of filling Northampton's energy needs. Be it further resolved that the City Council strongly supports Columbia Gas's replacement of old and failing pipes and its continued repair of all existing gas leaks to increase safety, reduce dangerous levels of greenhouse gas emissions, and increase capacity. Be it further resolved that the City Council strongly encourages Columbia Gas to consider liquefied natural gas storage as an alternative to pipeline expansion. Be it further resolved that the City Council supports the development and use of clean, renewable, non-fossil fuel-based energy sources for municipal buildings, as well as incentives for their use in residential projects throughout the city, and calls on Columbia Gas to vigorously join the city's efforts to increase energy efficiency, conservation, and conversion to efficient and sustainable heating and cooling of all residences and buildings. Be it further resolved that the City Council repeats its request to Columbia Gas to act with full transparency by sharing any data substantiating its claim that new infrastructure is the only method by which it can fulfill demand. And by providing Northampton with peak demand consumption numbers for the city covering the years of 2012 through 2017. Be it further resolved that City Council calls on Columbia Gas as it completes pipeline repair to consider so a selective lifting of the moratorium as necessary for gas needs that cannot as yet be safely or adequately met by alternatives. Uh, be, it uh, be it further resolved that the administrative assistant to the City Council shall cause a copy of this resolution to be sent to Columbia Gas President and Chief Operating Officer Stephen Bryant, U.S. Senators Elizabeth Warren and Ed Markey, U.S. Representative Jim McGovern, Massachusetts Governor Charles Baker, Northampton's legislative representatives at the state level, and Northampton, Massachusetts Mayor David J. Narkowitz. And the resolution notes uh, that this resolution was developed uh, through the initiative of and with the great assistance from Northampton activists from staying warm without additional pipelines. So having read the resolution, do I hear a motion to approve it for discussion? So moved. Second. <coughs> Made and seconded. Excellent. So I guess perhaps we could ask one of the sponsors to kick it off, but really it's open to any council who wishes to speak on this. Um, well, before we uh, discuss it, I'd like to just uh, take a look with everybody at the suggested amendments. Um, so I, I guess, move to make amendments. Would you like to kind of describe uh, the text of the amendments and then? Oh, we should do that before we. I think I have floor, it. I suppose. Um, sorry, now I'm pulling it out. It's okay. Should have been prepared. My agenda went away. Um, Bill, do you have them in front of yeah. you? Yeah. I mean, I can say one thing um, to start, which is that the reason for these amendments, um, and then we have a couple that we're actually going to add here on the floor that you don't have highlighted, 
um, is that we, uh, Councillor Dwight and I, brought this to the Energy and Sustainability Commission, and that's the first Scrivener's error that needs to change. It's not Northampton Sustainability and Energy Commission, it's um, Energy and Sustainability Commission. Um, the <coughs> day of the explosions in the Merrimack Valley. So literally while we were considering um, this piece of uh, this resolution, uh, the explosions were happening, but we didn't know yet. Right. And um, we left the meeting, and within 10 minutes after the meeting, we got word of what was happening in the Merrimack Valley. And we just felt like it was a glaring omission to not um, interweave into this resolution information about what happened in the Merrimack Valley, because it's so relevant to everything that we're trying to say about um, expanding pipeline capacity. So that's the reason for them, and uh, Here, so Dwight to, um, to, So the uh, proposed amended language would add after, I believe, the eighth whereas. Uh, it says, whereas on September 14, 2018, a series of Columbia gas pipeline explosions throughout the Merrimack Valley, cities of Lawrence, Andover, and North Andover, Massachusetts, resulted in 70 fires strong gas odors, the death of an 18-year-old man, injury to over 25 people, and the destruction of over 40 homes, 18,000 homes to be left without power, and mass evacuation of over 8,600 people from their homes. And whereas, another whereas, immediately following the pipeline explosions in the Merrimack Valley, USA, Senator, uh, U.S. Senators uh, Elizabeth Warren and Edward J. Markey requested a hearing and investigation to be conducted by the Senate Commerce Committee and asked Columbia Gas to, quote, cooperate fully and transparently with federal investigators, close quote. Mm -hmm. And then another whereas, the Massachusetts Department of Public Utilities will be conducting an investigation into the Merrimack Valley explosions and the Massachusetts Attorney's G Attorney General's office is tasked with ensuring that the DPU's investigative process is conducted and here's that word again, with transparency. Um, and then those, so those are the whereases, and then uh, the, what do we got? One, two, three, four, five, six. The seventh <coughs> be for the resolved would read, if accepted, uh, be it further resolved that the City Council supports U.S. Senators Warren and Markey in their efforts to ensure that the recent Merrimack Valley explosions are fully investigated at the federal level and, then, <clears throat> and that they demand higher standards of safety and transparency by Columbia Gas in all regions served by Columbia Gas in Massachusetts. And be it further resolved that the City Council encourages the DPU and the Massachusetts <coughs> Attorney General's Office to conduct a thorough and transparent investigation of Columbia Gas's role and responsibilities in the Merrimack Valley disaster and take sub, uh, subsequent steps to ensure that such a pipeline disaster never occurs again. And then in the final res resolve, we would like to add um, that this document be shared should it pass with uh, the Attorney General Maura Healy and also the Massachusetts Department of Public Utilities Chair Angela M. O'Connor. And those are the proposed amendments as they say. I, I hear that as a motion or are there further and with one small addition um, since we wrote the resolution that the staying warm without additional pipeline swap the work group of um, climate action now here in Northampton changed its name <laughs> so we'd like to change staying warm without additional pipelines at the very end of the resolution to um, succeeding without additional pipelines very good um, well, this is this is good for a first round of amendments. So I've heard this is made and seconded. Seconded, yes. Four, seven. So any discussion on those amendments? Um, all those in favor of those amendments, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? So those are adopted. The group can now not change its name again. Yeah. <laughs> well, at least <laughs> we can for right. second reading. <laughs> right. Exactly. You got until second reading. <laughs> Any other comments uh, now that we have the full text, uh, Councillor Dwayne? Um, fortunately, we were uh, well represented by voices of, of deep and, uh, and impassioned knowledge relative to this issue. So what I would add to that is that, <clears throat> and, and in fact, I have heard from some people who have expressed concerns about this, um, this resolution. Um, saying that uh, 
someone actually argued a social justice issue, which actually is not unreasonable. Actually, Sarah spoke to that in some level too, um, because the energy retrofits that are available um, tend to be for people who have the means in order to make those adjustments and or uh, if they're renting, they really don't get much of an option there. The fact remains is that it, it is, it's been pretty evident. I mean, we, in, in some bizarre way, actually, Columbia Gas did us kind of a favor. Um, they imposed the moratorium under the making the argument that they did not have the infrastructure to provide the capacity that Northampton demanded. The moratorium has existed for a, a considerable length at this point where Northampton's actually done what we're asking them to do, which is we've adapted. And in fact, it actually dovetailed beautifully with programs that we were promoting and uh, and an ethos that we were also promoting and, 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 and have supported in resolutions. And that was to make a conversion <coughs> from the consumption of fossil fuel and go to 100% renewables. Mm -hmm. They basically forced us, it was a forced, uh, an enforced austerity, which we responded to brilliantly. Um, we, 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 have, we have made considerable strides in this. The, and, I, and I would point to people that actually building right there, that little round building that we think is quaint and cute, that building actually was a source of gas for Northampton. It actually provided the lighting. It was coal gas, and it was they they would process it, and the gas would literally it wasn't pressurized. It would literally bleed into your house. Um, the older houses around here still have existing gas pipelines in their households. Hopefully, they're dead ended because that's turned out not to be particularly safe. Um, Mount Tom Power Plant in Hoya is a, is a coal fire plant that um, <laughs> I, I was alive when it was built. I had the pleasure of being alive when it's now scheduled for demolition to be converted into a solar field. The oil infrastructure, uh, many of the houses once upon a time were heated with coal. Then they made the cheaper, safer conversion to uh, oil. And if subsequently now, in some cases, made a conversion to gas and or other things. This is not actually calling for something that's unprecedented. We have been transitioning away from this. And it is, of course, the fossil fuel companies are indeed um, wealthy entities. And their mission, their job, is to maintain their wealth. That's anyone who, <laughs> who's affiliated and associated with a corporation that's they're required by law to continue to generate a profit that's not our mission and in fact it runs up a counter to our mission and our proposed ethos it's kind of hard to believe that in the intervening time as the course of the moratorium has stood that our demand has increased for natural gas i it's a and and Point in fact, I mean, I would say empirically that doesn't make any sense. But it's not from lack of asking. We have asked Columbia Gas frequently to provide data, particularly on peak consumption periods, to get a sense of just what it is they're making a case for, for an expanded pipeline that will run through other communities that will come at their own particular suffering under the aegis of supplying energy for us and I say I and I I I really do not want to be promoted as the community that we say to West Springfield and we say to Hoyoke and we say to other communities that yeah there was those pipelines for us because apparently we have this huge demand that we weren't aware of now let's be clear there are systems and there's and there's a, a um, one of the whereas is that and the resolves that addresses it that there are circumstances uh, in the community where, on, for better or for worse, the natural gas conversion would probably be the most feasible and economical possibility. And uh, the, uh, the example of Vernon Street was brought up, which is actually quite helpful. Mm -hmm. Vernon Street School has furnace, a furnace that is a monster of antiquity, and it's an oil fire furnace. They do not have the means nor the access to systems 
to convert and energy retrofit that place so that they could actually heat it, continue to heat it safely. Natural gas may be the only answer, but the fact is, is that if we have indeed reduced our demand, and if we do start to address the issue of gas leaks, that there can be an accommodation for systems like that that have special exception capacity to or, or status to be provided with the, that opportunity. The now the lumber yard project, of course, they were originally planning to use natural gas, and uh, they're now using propane, not an ideal situation. Uh, On-site propane storage is not what you would call especially ideal. But the fact is, is that also there were many splits. So there's also the, there's a system, and they're very efficient systems, and they're very efficient buildings that are currently there. So before Columbia Gas starts using us as an excuse for their expansion, they have yet to prove the need They've yet to approve a, a desire in the community for this service, expanded service. This is not to meet current capacity. This is to expand capacity and continue their ability to do their legal obligation of generating greater, generating greater profit. But that does run counter to our, our community desires. And also, not to put too fine a point on it, this, the sense of urgency that was pretty eloquently um, uh, presented to us tonight. Thank you. And anyone else? Please, Councilor. Uh, to that, um, in addition to, I, I mean, as Councilor Dwight said, the people that um, came and spoke from the public tonight are um, far more knowledgeable than I am about this, and I'm really grateful to them for all of their input and um, initiative around this resolution. Um, particularly Marty Nathan and Sharon Moulton. Um, and Councillor Dwight kind of covered uh, a bunch of uh, pieces that we didn't have in the resolution, we didn't hear. But I want to put a finer point on the whole issue of gas leaks. Um, the Columbia Gas, you know, purportedly has this need to expand capacity to meet need. and. We talked about this quite a bit in 2015 when we passed uh, the previous resolution about transparency and uh, fixing gas leaks. But I want to return to it because we have um, really good data, studies that were done by Senator Markey's office, uh, the Con Conservation Law Foundation, um, Harvard University, the greenhouse, uh, the Massachusetts Greenhouse Registry have all shown that by fixing the leaks that we um, have identified throughout the state, um, we can actually address any additional need for additional capacity. Um, so not only is it a, a, a way to ensure safety, but it's a way to actually meet um, capacity needs. Um, have a lot of data that I was going to share about the, the leaks and the um, amount that it actually costs the Massachusetts rate payers um, to fix those leaks, but that's uh, I'm not going to go really deeply with that. I do want to say, though, that the United States has 2.6 million miles of gas and oil pipeline, and that's the largest um, transportation network in the country. And um, as one of the, the folks who um, offered public comment shared, that's a, that's a real stranded asset. As we continue to develop 100% um, renewable um, methods of delivering energy, bringing energy to homes and businesses, we're not going to need that pipeline. And to, to sink more um, money and energy into building more of that pipeline for gas and oil, in this case, gas is completely, um, it's a 20th century project, and we're looking forward to do something different. Um, this resolution is just part of a, a, a bigger puzzle of what we're adv advocating for here in Northampton and throughout the Commonwealth. Um, it stands next to our call for transparency and our resolution from 2015, and it stands next to our resolution calling for 100% renewables by, uh, we didn't say what year, but supporting uh, 
rapid attainment of 100% renewable energy for Northampton and for the state of Massachusetts. Um, and so I think what we've done here um, is create kind of a quilt, as it were, of all the different pieces that we need for our city um, from calling for 100% renewables to asking for transparency from existing energy companies um, and demanding that we not create co uh, additional capacity when it's not even needed, um, we're moving into the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else on the council like to speak to this? Councilor Barge, please. Yes, um, I'm supporting this um, resolution 100%. I supported the others, and I'm just appalled by why we cannot get any transportation or communication from Columbia Gas. This is our city. We are asking them, I don't know how many times now, of giving us reports, <coughs> and like Councilor Dwight mentioned tonight, we have no knowledge of anything. I have concerns as a city councilor, how could we get that knowledge? And maybe Councilor O'Donnell, maybe <coughs> you could work on that, because I think that every resident here in this city should have rights of that transparency and communication. And uh, I, I wanna thank the um, two councilors for um, designing this resolution. Everything in it is absolutely true. And I think just even watching the explosion on TV was, to me, absolutely unnecessary. And I want to agree even hearing from Marty Nathan, because usually when she comes out with stuff, she's pretty right. But I think with Susan Ross, I think she's hitting it. I think it will happen earlier. So I am supporting this. Thank you, Counselor. Uh, any uh, councillor, uh, Shara? Um, I also want to thank the two sponsors and all the advocates who worked so hard on this. Uh, not only is this consistent with what we previously expressed by resolution as a council, but as uh, we stated, the urgency around the matter increases daily. Um, like others, I'm in no way convinced that further capacity is needed. Um, and we'd also like to see the very long requested data. Um, and I, like Councillor Klein was just talking about, I also think it's really unconscionable that there can be leaks of any size, creating emissions that have no benefit or use, mm -hmm. um, and that that us, the ratepayers, end up paying for. Um, and uh, every day, as, as Councilor Dwight very eloquently put it, you know, as we innovate around their moratorium, Columbia Gas's leverage, um, or someone said, uh, called it um, how they, their ability to hold us hostage, which I liked, um, decreases. And hopefully we can reach a point where they become irrelevant and they're not able to bully us at all anymore. Um, and hopefully we reach that point because we haven't all become irrelevant because we've destroyed this planet, but that we have just found a way where we don't have to depend on them in any way any longer. And so thank you all for this. And uh, I agree that we as a city are, are making good strides, but we can always do more. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Um, Councilor Carney. Just briefly to also thank the sponsors and to note that uh, a good friend and work colleague was among those in the city of Lawrence that lost his home. Um, he and his family are still, well, I mean, the house was completely destroyed. His wife had a daycare center in the, in the home, and luckily there was no, you know, there was nobody in the home when this happened. But um, it is unconscionable that, um, things like this happen, and I'm really grateful to the sponsors for bringing forward the resolution. Thank you. Other comments? Councilor Bibble? Um, I, too, am very grateful, particularly to Marty Nathan, uh, for her uh, expertise, the research, the time she's devoted to this and related topics, and her, and her leadership. And, and I, too, am, am supportive of the, of the resolution, especially the, the, the resolves. I think what it says we should be doing. I, I agree with every one of them. I'm uh, particularly um, <coughs> convinced that there's absolutely no case to be made for additional Columbia gas infrastructure, at the very least until we have thorough investigations like those that have been suggested here. And I'd, 
I'd love to see the, the answers, Columbia Gas's answers to the questions in uh, our September 17th, or the September 17th letter from Senators Markey and Warren. I think LNG storage possibilities are part of the solution and need to be explored, as is stated in the resolution. Yes, we need transparency. We need data on gas consumption. I do believe forecasts have been made on the basis of 20th century data, and they're not providing us with 21st century data. Uh, I agree with the concept of understanding uh, the impact on demand of our conservation measures and fixing of leaks so that we have some idea of what we've been saving so that maybe we can make a few exceptions here and there to the moratorium for some of the examples that uh, Councillor Dwight has, has, has suggested. I think it's crazy that we have an <coughs> oil-fired brew pub going in on Strong Ave, and I think it's yeah. crazy that we've uh, that we have affordable housing developments uh, with pro on site propane storage. Um, so, so for all, of, so I'm, I, I totally agree with where this is headed. I do think that in some of the whereases, we could be making an even stronger case, and a, a stronger case by what I view as, as, as cleaning up just a, a, a few. I, I'd rather see this be ironclad and totally accurate on the way to, to, to making the case. And there's just a, a few things that I would ask the, the sponsors to consider a, a rethink, perhaps, or a, a tweak between now and second reading. Um, the resolution claims in one of the whereas is that uh, the energy retrofits that we've seen in recent years and our increasing adoption of solar and heat pumps are, quote, in response to the moratorium. Well, the fact is, we all know that there was enormous momentum in the direction of this energy transition, and it may have gotten a boost here, but I think, I think it just, it's not quite credible to, to baldly state that all of this uh, transition uh, to uh, a less fossil fuel reliant economy in Northampton is a result of the, of the, of the moratorium. Uh, I, I, I just think we, we would it would be a, uh, we'd be making a stronger case if we if we avoided that that slightly uh, misleading cause and effect, um, and I also think that if if we want to if we want it to be comprehensive and accurate, we should mention that one of the things that definitely has resulted where there is a cause and effect from the moratorium is the fact that we've got. Uh, oil usage where there never would have been before, and we've got propane storage where there never would have been before. Um, uh, I think we so kind of cherry pick the implications of the moratorium by just talking about the things that we want to pat ourselves on the back on and don't call attention to the fact that there's some pretty uh, ugly things that have, that, have, that, have, that have happened too that we would rather not have happen. <coughs> and, and one last point that I would just like to make, and mind you, all of this is in the context of being uh, supportive of the resolution. But when we, I, I think before we get too carried away patting ourselves on the back about uh, our role in an aggressive adoption of green energy modalities, I think we need to uh, just be honest with ourselves that when we replace nat natural gas usage with electrical usage from the grid, <coughs> what we're effectively doing is displacing our own burning of fuels and uh, having other communities that host power plants burn those, burn those fuels. The most recent data from ISO New England that has the, the data on the makeup of the fuel sources in the grid is that of, of the electricity that we use from the grid here in Northampton, 43% of it is from fossil fuels. And that 26% of it is from nuclear. So let's just be clear before we get too proud of ourselves that w by switching to electric, it's cleaner here. But somewhere, uh, that electricity is being generated. And, in, and it's in somebody else's community. Uh, in fact, two-thirds of our electricity comes from either fossil fuels or nuclear plants where the electricity is generated elsewhere. And we can't lose, lose sight of that. Uh, I'm not arguing against our conversion to electricity, but let's remember where it, where it comes from, and that needs to be part of where we uh, keep our attention. So, so. Thank you very much, um, Councilor Dwight. Uh, um, Actually, on your first point, I absolutely agree. I think there's there's a way that that can be redrafted to uh, to actually expand the impetus for and the inspiration for for our uh, push towards renewable energy. 
Uh, the, the third point, though, um, you're quite right uh, on the statistics. I'm, I wouldn't be the least bit surprised. But the fact remains is that, for instance, the Heat Smart program is dedicated to converting solar, green energy, into, electric, in, into electrical consumption. So the mini splits, for instance, or air source heat pumps are <coughs> the perfect complement for a solar generated system. And that's what's being promoted in the community. It is with the uh, goal to also reduce whatever electricity that we, we generate or, or is allocated to us. It is, comes from green sources. And in fact, actually, you, there will be a collaboration, hopefully, the con ongoing collaboration with, uh, with Amherst and, uh, Helen, and, and uh, to even strive further towards that and succeed in creating essentially our own system that we have oversight of and also uh, the, the contributors will all be renewable sources. So I don't want to, I don't, the expanded use of electricity actually is considered and conscientiously uh, expanding by using renewables and, and committing to our renewables. It's not, uh, it's not a slavish devotion to uh, uh, electricity overall things as being the cleaner, the cleaner energy, acknowledging and recognizing that many, much of that energy production comes from, um, comes from nuclear generation, and which is also wheezing and dying, and, um, and other fossil fuel systems, including coal. So that, I think, so splitting those hairs on that one, I'm not, uh, I take your point, but I think it's, it's also, then we, at that point, we're, uh, the resolution may move into four, page four or something like that. So I'm a little concerned about that. But I, I do take, uh, I, I do agree with what you're suggesting as far as the, and I think the problematic word is in response. but. Uh, the moratorium certainly did, and this is the, my point about this, is that the moratorium did inspire people who might not otherwise have considered uh, the conversions and the retrofits and the, uh, <clears throat> the buttoning up their buildings and then considering solar systems. It, it, certainly, it certainly increased interest in it as the options became narrower. And that's another problem. <laughs> If Columbia Gas does increase its capacity, I think that would actually dampen or diminish the um, level of commitment and enthusiasm that's already been illustrated by us. So, but I, I think we can we can we can work with that and bang out something here that makes a little more sense and, and speaks to your point. Thanks. Anyone else, Councilor Nash? Um, so first of all, I'd like to thank the sponsors for the work they've done on this resolution. Um, that um, the, I, the the public comment tonight, I felt like you know, the, it, I'm a I'm a science geek, and to you know to hear you know all of the information that was shared tonight was was terrific. Um, that um, I'm completely in support of this this uh, resolution. Um, but I'm also interested in the entertaining the idea of sending this out to committee. Here's why. And strangely for this, I wrote a speech. Um, uh, we could bring in Columbia Gas and ask them some difficult questions. If we are using more gas, why do we need a gas, new gas line? Um, we, we see conservation on our end. What is the real data on our gas usage? We see gas leaks being repaired. Again, how much gas has been saved from the, the escaping gas? And where is the data? And why is this not shared with us? And all of the counselors have been um, referring to that. Um, we've seen a ham-handed moratorium by Columbia Gas um, that, um, that has impeded common sense gas hookups. Um, for affordable housing, for economic development, um, and that, um, that it's uh, stagnated sustainable development here in our city. Um, we also need safety assurances from Columbia Gas following the, the gas explosions in the eastern part of the state. Um, 
importantly, these frightening explosions followed gas line upgrades, something we have been seriously engaged in here in Northampton, and especially in the neighborhoods of Ward 3. Columbia Gas needs to assure us in person that what was done and what continues to be done is safe. Um, as you can see, um, I, this resolution gives council the opportunity to pull Columbia Gas in and hold them accountable for these, to ask them these questions. Um, also, in, the, in studying um, for my support for this resolution, I met with uh, Chris Mason, our energy and sustainability officer, who was instrumental in convincing me that this re resolution is soundly thought out, that our energy aspirations and our energy um, goals are starting to sync up. Chris convinced me we are well into the process of successfully converting to renewable energy, that a transition's going on, and that, um, that we're in that process. That actually surprised me. And I want to thank the sponsors because it in, encouraged me to speak with Chris. But I think that's another, um, that if, if this were in committee, we can pull in Chris and he can share that information more broadly. Um, I would also like to hear from the different uh, groups that were part of pulling this information together. Climate Action Now, SWAP, and Mothers Out Front. I mean, I, we heard from them tonight. I'd like to hear in more detail what it is they've been up to. I'd like to hear about the uh, button up Northampton in detail as to the, the success that they've been having. Um, and the last thing, what's going to be going on in two weeks is uh, the Office of Planning and Sustainability will be, have, will be holding an all day climate resiliency and regeneration workshop um, that um, I, I it's, it's on the calendar. I click on it. I haven't seen what the agenda is, but I, 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 uh, from my discussion with Chris, it has to do with actually um, having an energy discussion and how it relates to our sustainability plan. So it's to more firmly put our aspirations into something concrete. Um, so. My thought is that I would like to make a motion that we consider sending this out to a committee and to engage in these discussions, to bring in Columbia Gas, to hear from Chris Mason, to hear from the, um, the uh, folks in our community who are working on this initiative. And um, so that's my motion. To, uh, to which committee, Councillor? Well, that is the part I can't quite figure out because I would, I would send it to uh, community resources, and, um, but I know that that committee is actually pretty tied up right now, uh, holding some hearings on another resolution. <laughs> and, um, and maybe there's ways that pieces of this, you know, Chris Mason is a, that could go to city services and maybe, uh, Columbia Gas does go to community resources. Um, but that's, okay. that's my thought. So this is not quite a motion, but right. it's eligible for discussion if other counselors wish to. Councilor Bidwell. Um, I guess I, I, I would be supportive of setting it to committee. We, we, I, I'd rather hear directly from Columbia Gas than just communicate with them through resolutions. Um, We've asked in resolutions for them to come to us with data, but I'm not sure that they've been asked to make an appearance at a particular date and answer these five questions. And I think, I, and someone else, one of the folks making comment in public comment made a reference to let's, let's have a reasonable conversation with the utility. And, and I, th I, would, I would rather have them here, call them in, uh, they have a few other things on their mind these days, I know, but um, they have made an appearance at, uh, at a committee meeting just, just a couple of years ago talking about gas leaks. They, they 
want to be, I think, um, reasonably responsive, and they're under the gun now to be responsive. So I would support the notion of a, of a referral to committee uh, for purposes of conversation with Columbia Gas, getting answers from Columbia Gas, as well as the other reasons that Councilor Nash suggested. So I would second the three quarters of a motion um, uh, while we while we confer with one another as to what the appropriate committee would be. Okay. We're, so I think we're still in discussion phase without a particular. Uh, so there was a second. So, so it's on the floor. So. Councilor Carney and then Councilor. Well, I just say ordinarily when a um, order or a resolution comes from a committee, because this one is from Councilors Dwight and Klein and the uh, committee, isn't it also from the committee itself? Then it's the typical commission. that we don't send it back to committee when it's something that clearly has been discussed mm -hmm. in that committee. And again, but there, it does raise the issue that there may be some more information that we'd like. And I think we, that's the purpose of our second reading typically of having two readings for any order. I would, you know, if there is a way to impel <laughs> or ask um, Columbia Gas to come and answer some specific questions here, or even Chris Mason for additional information, I would support that rather than thinking it makes sense to send it back really to even a, you know, a less relevant committee than the committee from which it came, which was Energy, Energy and Sustainability Committee. That's my sense on it. Thank you, uh, Councilor Dwight. The, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, it had, they, we haven't been communicating with it just, it's a one-way communication. We have not been communicating just with resolutions. There has actually been uh, a, a direct request, not just from this council, but from, I believe from Chris Mason, relative to issues about peak use for the years that we described with no answers forthcoming. There have been some, some equivocating answers, but not nothing that actually provides us with the data that we requested. And then we requested a resolution as well. So I suppose we did communicate with them, presumably, by resolution at one point. And you're right. Um, we, the, we did get a chance to speak with the director of Columbia Gas uh, about the leaks, but also about the moratorium. Um, and in fact, actually, there was a promise of lifting the moratorium without any other, uh, as I recall, uh, without any other encumbrances at that time than we, we were talking a matter of uh, a year, I think, or so. Um, that's obviously didn't come to pass for a variety of reasons. I'm sure none that have been shared with us. Sending it, this to committee for an opportunity to find answers that we actually, uh, some answers we already have, some we're not likely to get. Um, now, there hasn't been an urgency stressed by uh, the community that's, that's uh, started this, although there is a timeline. They're, they're conducting a number of public fora mm -hmm. for an opportunity to have these same, very same conversations, but not under our aegis, but under a citizen's aegis. And I think this resolution is essentially reiterating things that we have already said and that we requested. There's nothing, I mean, the fact that we're not hearing from Columbia Gas either through resolution or by direct request, maybe they come, maybe they do, maybe we can schedule that and, uh, you know, whatever committee we put this in. But I suspect based on what you just said and, and also uh, Council Bidwell that basically is, is if we tick off everywhere as, with, with some exceptions, you're in accord with them. <clears throat> and that in, in the opportunity to change your mind, I suppose, uh, if Columbia Gas comes and makes a persuasive case, I would say the onus is on them to do that, not the onus is not on us to provide them an additional opportunity after multiple requests to come and make a case in answer to a resolution. That's just my thought. I really, I, uh, I would, to borrow the pun, I would, prefer, I would pre prefer to preserve the energy that's already invested in this and it's already experienced that you're uh, seeing from the citizens. Take this forward for a vote. But if the, if the council agrees it should be referred, then so be it. Uh, Councilor Klein. Um, first of all, I appreciate the um, enthusiasm of Councilor Nash um, and the 
the idea of bringing it kind of to a larger audience in the community and bringing in Columbia Gas are all um, noble and worthwhile concepts. Um, I do, I, I'm not sure though that this resolution is the vehicle by which I'd want to do that. I, I think that Councilor Dwight just made a really important point that there are community groups that are working really hard, really tirelessly, and um, conducting, they meet weekly, some of them monthly. Um, they just launched this huge campaign to, um, to uh, prevent uh, expansion of the pipeline and had a community forum at First Churches that was really well attended with a very illustrious panel, including our city council president, um, O'Donnell, as one of the speakers. And so there's a lot happening. I don't think it has to happen um, under our aegis. And there is a lot happening that I think um, we need to respect that's happening amongst kind of activists in the community. So that's that's one piece of it. And then, um, uh, Councilor Nash, you mentioned the, the forum that's coming up on sustainability. I think that there are already, there have been numerous <coughs> meetings about issues related to sustainability, particularly with regard to the 10-year uh, the plan that is being renewed this year. Um, so the Office of Planning and Sustainability, I see that um, Director Feiden is here. He could even maybe tell us, you know, everything that's in the works and all the public fora that are planned. So there are all these different um, ways in which I think this is already kind of being discussed very publicly. Um, there was one more point that I wanted to make, which was, um, just went out of my brain, sorry. Um, oh, I know. The, um, the Energy and Sustainability Commission is, to me, is kind of the locus of where a lot of these conversations need to happen. And one of the things I think we could do is we could uh, make a request of the, the mayor, since it's a mayoral commission, to um, give us kind of a purview of how we can engage the community in a more robust manner. But I'm not sure that sending it to one of our committees, I mean, essentially we have uh, community services and we have community resources. To me, it actually seems a little bit more like a services issue. Um, and I don't know what's on the plate of the, the community services committee, but I'm not, I'm not sure it actually fits there exactly um, either in either of those committees. And we do have the sustainability, the Energy and Sustainability Commission, where we're talking about these, these questions all of the time. So there may be a way to engage that commission and to engage um, uh, Chris a little bit more, uh, engage the, the Planning and Sustainability Office, talk to them more about what they're planning for the community. So that's, that's the direction that I would be inclined to go um, rather than send this to committee. Because as has been expressed, I think there is a, already a lot of energy put into, into this. There is an, a ton of community support for it. Um, a lot of community thinking went into the wording of the, the actual resolution. And um, I think it's just the movement of that, I think, is really important for us to vote on it. And, um, and we can figure out other avenues by which we can um, do more. Councilor Shara, then Councilor Bidwell. Um, I'll defer to the sponsors and how they want to um, handle whether it gets uh, referred or not. But I just want to commend Councilor Nash on um, some creative thinking and trying to create our own leverage against um, or leverage to use with uh, Columbia Gas and, and trying to compel them to come. So thank you for doing some creative work there. Yes. Okay. Councilor too. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if there, I, I, first of all, I, I I fully get the sense of urgency and the sense of moment, momentum that Councillor Klein describes. I'm certainly hearing it, feeling it, uh, and respect uh, all the work that's gotten us to this point. Um, so I'm wondering if, a, if a, a compromise position might be that if uh, several of us were to work with the Council President and authoring a letter to the President of Columbia Gas and tell him that this resolution will come up for second reading on October 18th, and here are some questions we'd very much like to have you come and uh, address. 
uh, either in writing between now and then or preferably in, in person, you or our representative, that would keep us on schedule for uh, a second reading October 18th and would provide another mechanism other than committee referral for trying uh, to, to get some answers. We could certainly say we had done everything possible and then some to, to get answers from Columbia Gas before finalizing uh, our, our vote on the resolution. It may very well be that they would not comply with that timetable, but we could ask. One, I, I think this is a good conversation to have. Um, one difficulty is, of course, the council, um, no one councilor can do something on behalf of the full council. We have to vote on it. So I, I couldn't go and represent the views of the whole council. Um, I couldn't even go with three or four councilors and, and, and speak for the whole council. I, I suppose I could myself issue invitations to, to anyone to participate in our in our proceedings. The other thing to point out is um, unless there's strong belief that hearing from Columbia Gas would change our underlying views, which are very kind of fundamental basic, <coughs> um, basic views expressed best by the members of the audience that you know, we're in a climate emergency, we need to go in a new direction. Um, there's always the reality that, you know, we can follow up with any, you know, outside entity like Columbia Gas separately from the resolution. And this is the belief, you know, people believe so strongly that hearing from Columbia Gas will flip opinions. Um, I'll give you my kind of substantive op opinion about, about the resolution. Um, I think this is a, I can understand this being a difficult resolution. Um, I think we're used to having resolutions that would kind of view as no-brainers. They're just kind of full-throated um, statements of principle. Uh, this one, I think, you know, there's definitely multiple dimensions to it. And I've also heard from people who've expressed um, concerns about the economic, the social justice and economic justice parts of this. But I think just because something, <clears throat> pardon me, just because something is difficult does not mean it's unclear. I think the transition to uh, renewable energy is actually a difficult transition. I think this is a difficult choice. That doesn't mean it's not a clear choice. For me, it is. I mean, I support this very strongly, and I think there is some urgency in doing it. Um, and so that's why I'd like to see this move forward personally, but I, I do think that, in general, we could ask for more information on an ongoing basis um, from utilities like Columbia Gas separately from this resolution. So, Councillor Toy. Um, just to note that the should this pass in two readings without going to committee, uh, without hearing from uh, Stephen Bryant, the the, um, the CEO or the, the C chief operating officer of uh, Columbia Gas, <clears throat> this will be sent to him. Um, and if if this actually prompts some concern in him. Or feels that this may in some way impede their progress or that they've been unfairly represented of course we have given them multiple opportunities to represent themselves and mr. Bryant actually was very good about I mean he not only attended the meeting uh, with the former DPW committee but he also uh, he went to the neighborhoods uh, particularly in Ward 2 discussing the, the gas leaks he has been he, he's said very clearly he would be readily available I'm not so much concerned about his availability. I'm concerned about the data's availability, which can be transmitted very easily. And the data that we have asked for, supporting data that makes their case for uh, expanded infrastructure, for the opportunity to actually expand capacity, not only just meet capacity, but to expand capacity. There, that has not been forthcoming. I can understand why they might not want to share that. I, not that they're necessarily being duplicitous. It's something they would, I'm sure, much prefer that remain in camera. The fact is, this will go to him. If he feels that there is a need to come speak to us to, to, to make his case, and if his case is so persuasive, we can actually, we can come back and make our correction if we are so persuaded. But I think I take your point. I don't, I don't think that's all that likely. 
Councilor Murphy. And, and I mean, if you think of Columbia Gas right now, um, they've just blown up a lot of the Merrimack Valley. I don't think they're going to be building any pipelines realistically anytime soon. I think their resources are going to be spent there. So are they going to make it a priority to come up to talk to us when they're in crisis mode over what they did there? I seriously doubt it, and, and not because perhaps they're not, they don't, don't want to. I think they got other fish to fry right now. So, so I, I don't, we're, it, sorry about that. <laughs> but uh, they got other things on their mind right now. And does, you know, is this company even around? Do they get absorbed by somebody else? I think, you know, I don't see us hearing from them just because they're very engaged somewhere else. But I don't realistically see them even building this pipeline anytime soon. Uh, just because of the crisis they have in the other part of the state. So um, I think delaying to hear from them is kind of silly because I don't think we're going to hear from them because they don't have the time to deal with us right now. And those are all excellent points. I, I quite agree. And I think then right now is the opportunity to say, look, should you ever come around to us again? We just let you know this is where we sit. Yeah. And Love to hear from you. But yeah. Yeah. Send us a card or something. Uh, Councillor Nash, and then we'll try and cycle back and maybe come to a vote. Soon. Well, I'm, yes. I'm hoping we're, this will help. Okay. So um, anyway, it, I want to be clear that my idea here is not to stifle energy, but to actually build on the energy of this resolution. Um, and um, that I can appreciate what my colleagues are sharing here. And that um, so I, I, I like to withdraw. Can I do that? Yeah. Can I make a motion? Yeah. And, um, but also uh, that we ask uh, community resources to reach out to Columbia Gas and invite them to come speak to you know, these, these questions that we have. Um, I, the, I, you know, several years ago, we, we, Steve Bryant was here and he spoke to the leaks. We invited him, he showed up. And I, my, my hope is that, you know, if council again invites him, that, you know, that there, you know, we are concerned about the safety of the, the gas lines here. And that what happened in the Merrimack Valley had to do with replacing lines. And we need assurances that what they're doing here is different from over there and is much safer. And, um, and I, I would hope that they would want to come and speak to us and spend a little time with us. So I'm withdrawing that okay. motion to send it to committee. And, and so procedurally, encourage any, any committee to take up, you know, any important matter, including this one. I think it's we leave it to the committee themselves rather than have the council send, send something um, to them unless it's a specific committee study request under the rule. So. That question we leave to the committee to decide um, for today, but I actually appreciate that approach. Uh, Since I'm on that committee, okay. I will work with the chair to okay. help with that invitation. Okay. Um, good discussion. Anything else on the substance of the resolution? Are we ready to proceed to a vote? Yeah. My first reading. Sounds like we are. Great. Um, so on first reading, I'll ask for a roll call. Yes. 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 The resolution is approved unanimously in first reading, and we'll return to it at our next meeting in two weeks. Um, we have a presentation from Director Fiden. Um, I'd like to ask him if he would be willing to come up and and do that, and then I, I suggest if counselors want, we could have a recess, if that's of interest, after the presentation. Great. So, Director Fiden, thank you. I, just for the council, I don't, I don't know exactly the content of your presentation, but I don't think this is a free-ranging discussion about all aspects of zoning for the council. Oh, come on. I know, it's, <laughs> it's a crushing, it's <laughs> a crushing uh, uh, requirement on my part. But, it sounds like this is about process and your okay. So, yes. so the floor is yours. Short. Can you be happy to know I have no <laughs> slides. That's a rarity for me. Um, so it's really basically just to fill you in on what's going on <laughs> in this effort. 
Um, so it's, I lose, I'm sorry, I remember everything I've been involved with the city except I lose all track of time, so don't ask me how long ago things happened. But 15 years ago, um, we, you know, literally between 20 years ago and 10 years ago, we did some extensive rezoning of both downtown <coughs> Since then, we've tinkered a little bit. We, I mean, you have allowed housing above the first floor in office industrial areas. We've expanded a Central Business District down Pleasant Street a little bit. Um, we've increased the height limit. Uh, we've reduced parking. But we haven't really done a comprehensive effort in 15 to 20 years. And so the brief message is it's time. We need to come back and resolve them. The, the story I like to tell is in 100 and some odd years ago, when the railroad, when the Main Street crossed the railroad, somebody said, this is unsafe, let's raise the railroad and lower the road. And obviously the truck eating bridge, but I don't have anything to go there. Somewhere in that process, we lowered the road and we didn't lower the curbs. And every year someone trips over the curb because it's more than six inches high and they get a twisted ankle because a decision was made 120 years ago. And we don't want to just sort of do a slow evolution in our zoning and not think about it. It's, it's, you know, you're always going to get some small zoning changes as time goes by, but it's important to be mindful, to step back and not just say, this makes sense now because of some project, we want to step back. So that's really what we're trying to do. We've hired Dobson and Flinker, which is a, a Florence-based uh, firm, planners and landscape architects. And we're sort of in the second stage of the process. Last year, we had some health money. Health isn't usually involved with planning, but we had a health grant from Centers for Disease Control to say, what are the ways that our zoning affects our public health? So you think about Shaw's Motel. When Shaw's got rebuilt, this property got rebuilt, we had a requirement that they have to rebuild up to the street curb. <laughs> you can imagine we want really wide tree belts with wonderful trees. We want to catch drainage from the street. We want really wide sidewalks. We want you know, bike racks. But that's all fixed, right? The, the property line's here, the road's here. There's not enough room for that. And so the process was the planning board, when they came before them, had to say, well, here's the right match between sidewalks and tree belts. And that's great. I think the planning board did a wonderful job. But we just need to step back every so often and say, is that the right mix? Is the thing, are the things that we did in previous years make sense? I, I give you one more example on the public realm. If you go to the neighborhoods, many of them these wonderful tree belts that are landscaped and wonderful. And then downtown, we get a lot of heavy traffic. We have concrete that goes to the curb, and we have tree boxes. Right? We can, we can tinker with the tree boxes. I'm not going to go there. But in between, we have places where we have grass strips between the sidewalk and the road. But we have so much traffic, because people park and they step off their their car all the time, that we don't have a grass strip. We have a strip of dead mud. You know, if you look sort of by the post office, you see some of this. That it doesn't really work. It made perfect sense whenever that zoning was done a long time ago. So we just want to look at those things, big stories, little stories. We're calling this a tune-up, but really we're, we're meeting both downtown and in Florence, and we're just hearing people's stories. And, you know, maybe at the end of the day, absolutely no change happens. That's fine. That's a valid outcome, most likely some sort of change happens. While we're doing this, we're, this gets a little into inside baseball, but while we're doing this, we're framing this around something that's form-based code. And we actually have code downtown that's very form-based, so the, the language doesn't really matter, but there's two things we're trying to do. One is, this may not be exciting bedtime reading, but you all should be able to pick up the zoning ordinance and understand what we're actually calling for. And I just don't think that's true. We don't have enough graphics. We have too much words. And it's hard to do that. And the other thing is both neighborhoods who want to know what's going to happen next door to them and developers who want to know what's going to happen when the project is approved <coughs> should have a more certainty what the outcome is. And form-based code is sometimes described as sort of a, a pre-permitting. We have lots of discussions now about design and what it looks like, and then we, we address it for, for form. Um, so there's a couple issues in both downtown and Florence. I'll, I'll focus on just briefly, and then I, I won't go too long. But downtown, we've had the Central Business Architecture District for 20 years. Um, and, and I've been in the city now for 30 years, um, almost to the day, actually. Um, 
in the time I've been here, we've basically tripled the size of the central business district. Now, that wasn't a huge business expansion because it used to be other business districts. Um, we have design standards that make absolutely sense for a third of our central business district. And we kept expanding it. We didn't necessarily go back. And, and Councilor Murphy, to his credit, said this from the beginning. He said, I get central business architecture on the brick core city, brick port part of the city, but does it make sense in those transitional residential neighborhoods with wood frame buildings? Does it make sense on Lower Pleasant Street? We knew we wanted to do something that was very design oriented, and that's why <coughs> we kept expanding central business. One of the things the form-based code lets us do is say, are there ways to control design that aren't all about historic preservation? Right? Main Street should be historic preservation. We have amazing Main Street, second to almost none. Um, and those brick buildings are amazing. But maybe on, and again, this is just trial balloons. This isn't the way we're going. But maybe on the northern side of Center Street, maybe on the southern side of Pleasant Street, we definitely need design control. But maybe it's not the same sort of materials count. Um, and so at least we want to explore that kind of thing. Uh, again, no, you know, nothing's on the table, nothing's being proposed, but we want to go through those kinds of things. Um, Main Street is almost 100 feet wide, so our height limits make sense on Main Street. Pleasant Street is narrower, so maybe the, high, the same height limits don't make sense on Main Street. Main Street had only four driveways, <coughs> got rid of one driveway. We actually have a property owner who's approached us to say, hey, maybe I should close the second driveway. Main Street really shouldn't have driveways. Um, but of course, you can have driveways in all of the streets. And so they're just letting us look back and say, does this always make sense, you know, the way we have it? Florence has different sets of issues. You know, for, for a long time, there wasn't a lot of construction. We're not getting a lot, but we've had, you know, one building last year and one building this year, and there's another building proposed on South Maple Street. And it's interesting, the number of calls I've gotten, and it's, I think it's a small minority, the number of calls saying, why do you let that kind of design go through and fill in the blanks? And maybe it's the problem of being here so long, but I remember 20 years ago having the conversation in Florence, do you want to have design control? This is really up to you. And the overwhelming response was no. I don't know if it's changed. I don't know if the, the five people who've called us about Cumberland Farms are five people or if they're a movement, but we want to ask that question and figure out what we're doing. Um, we want to think about, you know, we did an, an incredible job, I think, um, in terms of lowering energy use with the, the street light program. But we just replaced light bulbs. We didn't necessarily rethink those streets. I often point out Strong Avenue as my favorite example, where you have tall cobras and you have ground period type lighting. It's like, well, what do we want? I don't know. But we, we haven't really had that conversation in a long time. So this is really the opportunity to do those things. We're totally open. We've, we've had already outreach with business groups, DNA, Chamber Economic Development, and Florence Civic. Um, we have coming up, and we just had on Monday an open session for downtown, and then we have coming up on Tuesday, October 30th, a session in the Florence. Um, so at this point, we're just sort of saying, here's what the rules, rules call for, here's where there's some conflict, what do you want? And then, you know, within the next four months, I hope we start coming back to you all the different committees with concrete proposals. And obviously, it's going to be a very long process. Thank you, Director Fight. Any kind of clarifying questions <coughs> or anything like that from the council without kind of getting into uh, Councilor Dwight? It, so how many more forms you or, or charrettes or whatever do you anticipate that you would have? So we're trying not to have too many charrettes, because almost what we've discovered happens is if we do too often, some people come to three and say the same thing. Right. So at this point, just the one downtown and the one in Florence at, at sort of the beginning, where any, anything goes. But then once we start coming up with ideas and drafts and proposals, then we'll come back in some sort of workshop format. But then it starts being, here's what we think, did we get you right? Here's what we think you said to us. And, and how long do you? Based on what we've done in the past, how long do you think this process would take? I, you know, I'm hoping the consultant piece, which is the big framework, is going to be done in March or April or somewhere thereabouts. But that's not to preclude, as it goes through the board process and all the discussions right. we have, obviously it's going to evolve beyond that. And that will take, we're, we're not in a particular hurry, that's the good part of this. So three months to uh, two years, depending on what the conversation takes. Okay, okay. thanks. Anyone else? Questions? Okay. Oh, Councilor. 
Um, the the forum that's going on in two weeks. Do we know what that is? Can, you know. Yes. Okay, so these are two separate projects. We've been lucky in grants, which is why we're able to do some of these projects at the same time. So this form-based code project, this zoning project, is 100% is grant-driven. I mean, this is staff time involved, but the funding is grant-driven. We're also doing this climate resiliency and regeneration plan that was partially driven by capital improvements, which you all approved, and partially driven by a grant we had. So the idea is to really think about all things resiliency, all things regeneration. Those are the terms we're using. Resiliency, think of we're getting ready for climate change. No matter what happens, the climate will change. The trees that survive in North Carolina will be here. The trees that survive in Vermont won't be here. You know, things move north. Um, and then regeneration is climate mitigation, so reducing our carbon footprint but also thinking about all the other things affected. So how do we deal with invasive plants? So it's, so it's a more broad regeneration piece. Um, so we're open to all those things. What we're trying to focus on is really hearing data from two different sources, and they're, they're both equally important. We want to hear from the community. So the forum is October 23rd. There's actually three forums we're going to have that day. During the day, we're having invitation only stakeholder meetings to make sure that different groups are represented so low-income individuals who are often left out advocacy groups you heard some of the advocacy groups earlier tonight um, you know institutions lots of different groups then we're having an open public forum from 5 30 to 7 30 and then we have a separate grant that's just look at resiliency look at 10 sites in the city and think are there opportunities to grab stormwater on these sites before it hits our pipes so Remember, we spent almost $2 million replacing 500 feet of pipe by Holyoke Street. Now, that is the hardest pipe in the city. It's 140 years old. It's right next to a railroad. But we could never replace all the pipes in the city that are going to be necessary, both because of age and because of climate change. So we want to think about how do we catch the water from that. So that forms at 730 to, to do this. Um, I, I just want to go back to, to one thing that maybe Councilor Klein said I can't remember about the open space, <coughs> the, uh, the sustainable Northampton plan. So we sort of lied to you, though not deliberately. Um, about a year ago, we said we're going to be revising the sustainable Northampton plan this year. We put it off. We're putting it off. We're putting it off for three very deliberate reasons. We looked at the plan and said, where is the plan the weakest? And we identified three areas, walking and biking. And we did, and you've all approved, a walk-bike plan resiliency re regeneration so we're doing that and then an overall vision for land use so that's why we're doing this form based code piece so we're actually working on the plan but we're sort of doing these three sections that are most that require the most amount of heavy lifting if we finish the re resiliency and regeneration plan maybe next march then that's when we start on the rest of the plan so this even though it's about resiliency and regeneration we think it's a framework for everything in the plan because these, you know, if we're really going to deal with climate change, we need things that cut across all the different operations the city does. Well, we really appreciate you taking the time and sitting through a long meeting to give that presentation. It's very helpful. So thank you, <coughs> Director Fine. Thank you. Like uh, so uh, this time, <coughs> break. yeah. Okay. Um, so seven minutes. Come back at uh, nine fifteen. Stand in recess until then. <laughs>
Present. Present. Here. Excellent. Um, so, our first item is to approve minutes from our previous meeting, which would be September 20th. Do we have a motion? Move to approve. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Please aye. say aye. Aye. And uh, the, we have one word tonight, and uh, it's 18171, in order to authorize the acquisition of easements for Avis Circle. And if, if everyone remembers, we went through a, a process here of taking streets that weren't really streets and making them streets. And Avis Circle slipped through the cracks on that one. And some attorney doing a title search discovered that we petition had been signed, submitted, but we never followed through and as a body took the street. And in keeping with the fact that we, all, we have more than one version of things, there's actually two versions of order 18171 uh, because it got changed from when the meeting got posted and tonight because uh, basically the first version of it said <coughs> to authorize the mayor to acquire but it was decided we needed to take it by eminent domain so now uh, the city council is going to uh, acquire because the mayor can't do eminent domain only we can <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is read the new version and then in finance ask that we amend to the new version from the old version but truly the the only change is switching the mayor being authorized to the city council authorizes acquisition so this is 18171 an order authorizing acquisition of easements for the laying out of avis circle as a public way and this is from way back in 1999 order that whereas by its uh, action August 19th 1999 the City Council voted to lay out and accept as a public way that parcel of land shown as Avis Circle on a plan entitled Commonwealth of Massachusetts Street Acceptance Plan of Avis Circle prepared for the City of Northampton Hampshire County by Elmer Huntley Jr. and Associates dated March 4th 1999 and revised March 25th 1999 and recorded in the Hampshire County Registry of Deeds plan book 187 page 116 Whereas, in order to complete the layout of Avis Circle, the City Council must authorize the acquisition of an easement over that way. So now, therefore, to be ordered that not the mayor, but the City Council hereby authorizes to apply um, the acquisition by purchase, gift, or eminent domain, or otherwise, of easements over a parcel of land shown as Avis Circle on a plan entitled the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Street Acceptance Plan of Avis Circle, prepared for the City of Northampton, Hampshire County by Amherst. Elmer Huntley Jr. Associates dated March 4th, 1999 and revised March 25th, 1999 and recorded in the Hampshire County Registry of Deeds, Plan Book 187, page 116. Uh, no appropriation is needed for this acquisition. So that's, that <coughs> is the version uh, that we are amending to. The other version we're amending from simply said the mayor is hereby authorized to acquire by purchase gift. This one's going to be uh, the city council hereby authorizes the acquisition. That's the only difference. And move huh. the, uh, the amendment. The amended, in, in yeah, amendment. Somebody else in is going to second in finance. So, <laughs> right. so just to be clear, you, you're essentially you're taking up the original unamended one, and this motion is equivalent to amending. Amending, it, yeah. as you stated. Mm -hmm. okay. And I read the new one because it's pretty redundant even in itself, and to read two of them with a minor change like that, I just read the current one. Right. All right. Is there so, any? Uh, I'll move the original um, and then Proposal. I'll go ahead and move an amendment. Okay. And Second Councilor that. seconded that. Okay. Is there any other discussion? You all have this in your packet. Um, and it, again, it was an 11th hour. Oops, the City Council has to take it. The mayor, we can't authorize the mayor to do it. We have to vote to do it. And we'll end up having, when it's done, to sign a thing to authorize it. So, is there any further discussion on this one in finance? I, I have a question, uh, and it's not on the amendment, but the on the order. And it, you had said that this was actually an oversight of the uh, most recent street acquisition, which was not well, 19. No, no, it was an oversight back in 99. Right. But when we did the most it's, recent, we missed it. Because we presumed it was already accepted. Because we presumed it was already done. And I think a lawyer doing a title search brought it to our attention and said, hey, you guys you went through the motions but you didn't you didn't finish it off got it just so i guess just we're, we're finishing off something that's been dangling since right. 1999 okay. um just very nice street though. yeah very nice street <laughs> they're all very happy there but uh, 
we missed the fact that we never finished. And, and we have been plowing it. Our, our predecessors it's didn't quite finish. Yeah, so. Um, then <coughs> all in favor of a positive recommendation in finance, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And I'll move the amendment, the proposed amended language changing the mayor to the city council. Okay. Second. 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 Any discussion on that one? No. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Oh, yeah. well, good. Twice. Twice even. We're even better than good. So Counselor. for the record, the minutes, uh, for the record, the positive recommendation is on the amended version. Yes. Even though you Correct. technically amended it after. Yeah. Which it, is right. it, fine, but that's kind of the it understanding right, of the committee. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then when it comes to council, you're, you're going to deal with the amended version. Right. Because uh, we fixed right. it in finance. So believe it or not, um, Move to adjourn. There's no new Second. business. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, so now we will take up 18171, <coughs> order authorizing acquisition of easements for Avis Circle as amended by the Committee on Finance. Is there a motion to approve? So this? moved. Second. Okay. Made and second. Any discussion on the order? Um, roll call, please. Yes. Yes. Councilor Yes. 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 Orders proven first reading. Uh, number of second reading orders, financial orders. First, 18161, order authorizing the mayor to accept industrial park lot and allow its use for Damon Road reconstruction. There's a motion to approve. Move to approve. Made by Councilor Klein, seconded by Councilor Barge. Any discussion? Uh, if not, roll call. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Donald. Yes. Councillor Sheriff. Yes. 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 Approved. And second reading. Now 18162, an order authorizing waiver of right of first refusal and conservation commission acceptance of Park Hill Road. Motion to approve. Second. Second. Made by Councillor Labarge. Second by Councillor Dwight. Any discussion? Roll call. Councillor Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. 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 Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Donald. Yes. Councillor Sheriff. Yes. Councillor <coughs> Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Yes. Approved in second reading. 18.163 in order to appropriate funds for community preservation purposes. Move to approve. Second. Okay. Made it. Second. Any discussion? Roll call. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Mercy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Donald. Yes. Councillor Sheriff. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. 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 Dwight. Yes. Yes. It's approved as well. We proceed to 18164 in order to authorize a payment of taxes agreement with CED Northampton Solar LLC. Motion on this to approve. So moved. Second. Second. Councilor Dwight, second by Councilor Shara. Any discussion? Um, Mr. Mayor, did you have further information to provide on this order um, as we discussed That's it right. last time? I certainly can. Um, I, there were a number of questions, and um, <coughs> I did have an opportunity to uh, do further research and meet with um, the chair of finance um, as well. And um, I think I can <coughs> illuminate a little more clearly on this to, to try to answer some of the questions. Um, first and foremost, there was a big question about the 20-year time horizon. And so the is at issue here and the reason why there's been so much confusion is that there's now been a series of ATB cases which have basically declared these facilities as tax exempt um, in local communities for 20 years. Like that has been the time horizon that has been spelled out. And, um, and so that is why a number of communities, that's why if you frequently look at these agreements, they're 20 year agreements. And so we have consulted with um, Ken Gerd, who is our, um, assessor's attorney. Um, we've consulted with the DOR, including as recently as today, because uh, Susan Wright happened to attend a day-long DOR seminar in which there was a slide on this. Um, it basically stems from a, a law related to the exemption of these that was back in the 1970s or 1980s, when solar back then was literally direct connection to um, your no, there was no water. net metering. Right. There was no selling back to the grid. There was no anything. You were directly powering your home. And so the thinking, the policy was, you know, we're not going to tax that system because it's just an, it's an energy appendage to your house. It's, you know, to your house. 
fast forward, and now you've got these fields of solar farms, which um, cities and towns thought, well, that's different. That's not actually. But lo and behold, the ATB ruled that they were uh, they, they were supplying energy to a tax taxable property, um, and so you know <coughs> one of the mo more notorious <coughs> cases, which was from last year. Um, the town of, I think it was Swansea, ended up having to abate like almost a million dollars to one of these projects um, because the ruling was that the interpretation of supplying energy to a tax taxable property extended to a net metering agreement, um, including, you know, you're, you're not directly providing the energy to that home. So um, there's legislation pending uh, that's been pending for several years to try to correct it. Um, <laughs> but in the meantime, the advice of our council and the advice of the DPR, um is to enter into these um, pilot agreements. Now, you may say to yourself, well, if the DOR and the ATB has declared them tax exempt, why in the world would the developers agree to a, agree to a pilot? Um, I think they don't act, they actually know that this is sort of bogus and the jig is probably going to be up at some point. Um, and they um, are concerned about it and they're concerned that it's either going to go to the SJC or the legislature is going to act to correct it. Um, so they're not, they're not so, um, so I think they want the surety of we'll have a pilot agreement. At least we know for, the, as they're trying to plan. Um, when they put together one of these deals and they're trying to put together, you know, how many, how many <clears throat> credits they're going to get and what the cost is going to be, et cetera, that they have the surety of that, um, of that agreement. So what I would say to you is I will, um, I will work to make sure, and we've tried to, the other thing that's tricky about it is there's also an ambiguity about what's real estate and what's personal property, um, meaning you know, we traditionally think of real estate as the land and personal property as the equipment, <laughs> but there's also a lot of ambiguity about which is which, and there's a lot of different cases about it. So, because technically, we you know, we we can we assess a different type of personal property tax, same rate on personal property versus real estate, um, but there's an ambiguity there. The other thing that the pilot will give us uh, clarity on and surety on, because it, it'll be built into it, is that. For purposes of our laws here, it'll be treated all as real estate, um, which is important because we can then, if we can then lean it, attach a lien to it. Um, personal property, you can't lien personal property. Um, personal property, and we have lots of personal property bills that will never get paid because the businesses went out of went out of business, and you can't lien a defunct business. So, um, so anyway, that's, those are the reasons why so many communities are doing pilots. Um, what I, what we will be doing when we, um, finalize this is all is to ensure, um, using our best estimates, uh, we obviously know the real estate, um, piece of it, and we'll try to use our best estimates for the personal property side of it. And we'll just make sure that, uh, we're not going to receive any less in property tax than we would have received if we were attempting to do this the normal way. Um, so that's my commitment to you on that. And um, again, there's other factors. You know, the, the technology is rapidly changing. There's been infusion of a lot of Chinese technology. And there's, so there's a lot of uncertainty with anything like this. So I think part of it is it gives us certainty of knowing that we're going to collect um, you know, property taxes on the property uh, without having it be appealed to the ATB and we end up having to abate the property tax. Um, it also gives them the surety to be able to plan and finance the deal knowing what their tax payments will be over the next 20 years. Thank you. I actually think that's very helpful. I, I appreciate mm -hmm. you. And I wish I had had um, that much detail last time. I, I yeah, That's okay. I've read more about this and Read Sounds like you had a great time learning. Uh, yes, exactly. Learning expedition. But we had <laughs> Councillor Klein, and then we'll go to yes. Councillor Murphy. Yeah, it is very helpful, uh, very elucidating. But I'm wondering that if, as you say, the jig will be up at some point, and there's legislation pending that could um, shift how this is framed. Why would we lock ourselves into the city into a 20-year 
structure mm -hmm. that could in fact change with a new piece of legislation or whatever else? Um, because I don't, f because I have, well, I say the jig is up, but I mean, the legislature has known about this for a while and they have not corrected it. And the bills continue to be filed by MMA every year and they don't go anywhere. Um, so I don't want to say that, you know, I don't want to say that it's going to happen or it's going to be fixed immediately. We don't know that for sure. We hope it will be fixed. Um, but I'm, again, I don't think we're locking our self into something because we're going to make sure that that the agreement represents a fair revenue that would represent what we think it would be valued at, including with inflation and the two and a half percent increases. Um, so I think we're not going to be losing anything in the deal. They're actually probably taking more risk because, again, um, you know, these these solar fields, the technology changes, um, if they don't end up generating the amount of energy they thought they would, et cetera, they're probably more at risk than we are. So um, the bigger risk is that we say, okay, we're not going to do this and we're going to just send you a tax bill, um, is that we would end up at the ATB and we end up, you know, losing, um, at least in the near term. So, and again, this is happening, communities all around us um, are doing this. Um, the most recent example, and actually they showed the slide today at the DOR, one of the, one of the slideshows, because uh, Susan actually sent me a picture of it was of a um, of an even more recent case again where the ATB um, ruled uh, it was Quabbin Solar versus the Board of Assessors of Barry you know which is right near bias in the Quabbin um, and it was just issued at the end of last year November uh, 2017 and um, and again they uh, the, they, the, the town tried to tax, send them a tax bill. There was um, an appeal, pile, uh, appeal filed, and basically um, the town lost. So, um, so that's why I'm recommending that we do this in the 20 year. And again, if the 20 year, uh, if they determine that they're not tax exempt, then we can certainly revisit it with them. Um, but, I, but this seems to be the clearest course at this point. Yeah, and I, I was very involved in all of these conversations with the, with the mayor and the finance director. Um, we really are, are pretty well off if our pilot reflects what we would have been taxing them conventionally, then we're really not being injured by going to the pilot because the pilot's going to be similar to what we would have gotten anyway. But the pilot won't have the risk because they can't really, they can't take the pilot to the ATB, which is sort of an administrative law arrangement that deals with arguments over assessments and abatements. And the three parties, the, you know, the ATB, the legislature, and the, the Supreme Judicial Court, any one of them could wind up dealing with this one way or the other, um, but not if it's a pilot. So if we're, as long as we're collecting what we would have gotten anyway, we're safe. And sooner or later, one of those entities is going to give this some clarity. But in the meantime, we'll be getting a payment in lieu of taxes that we would have gotten anyway. And whatever they decide, you know, we'll, we'll fall in line with that based on who decides and what the decision is. Uh, Council Joy. The, uh, the, the Swansea project, of course, the ATD actually, part of the reason for 20 years is uh, they, their exemptions they assigned. Right, didn't the ATB assign the Swansea project a, a 20 year exemption? I think so the you, idea was that, like, the, the the useful life of one of these fields is right. 20 years. And that makes sense. Yeah. And then so if the exemption period is granted by the ATP for 20 years, it makes sense that you would want to negotiate a pilot that would also correspond with that 20 year exemption. Yeah. So Swansea, you know, had to pay back. They paid a ton of money. Almost a million dollars. Yeah. And then promptly negotiated a pilot. A 16, 16 year, year, year at that point. Yeah. To, which yeah. was the remain, remainder of the 20 years. Right. Um, so. No, and, and that helps also as far as clarification more than 20 years. Exactly, as opposed to 10. Uh, yes, or, yeah. yeah. You, want, you want to cover the exemption that's already been granted by the state agency, the state authority, so. Yeah. Councilor Sherry, did you have your hand up? No, okay. Um, well, thank you. I'm actually um, totally comfortable with this. Like, like I said last time, we can talk about whether we're going to come out ahead or, or behind on this, but really that's the wrong way to think about a, a policy decision. It's not an investment. It's is this fair? And I have every confidence that the mayor will uh, negotiate a, 
a fair agreement, and I think that the time frame is makes sense to me based on the advice we've gotten. So, okay. so again, thank you. Yep, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, any other discussion? Okay. So we have a motion on the floor, and I'd ask for a roll call. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shera. Yes. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Councilor. <coughs> yes. Councilor yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. 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 Okay. Uh, that is approved. Now we proceed to 18165, an order authorizing payment of a prior year bill. Motion to approve this. Move approval. Second. Second. Councilor Dwight, seconded by Councilor Klein. Any discussion? Councilman Nash. Yes. Councilor Dollar. Yes. Councilor Shera. Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. Yes. Okay. That is approved. Now we come to 18167 order authorized using $3,600 from Senior Center Gift Fund for financial aid programs. Approved. Made and seconded. Um, this has been amended to correct 180, uh, to reflect the figure of 180. Yeah. Okay. Um, very good. Yeah. Yeah. Trust it's yeah. the case. Very good. So we can have a, a roll call on this unless there's any discussion. Okay. Okay. Roll call. Okay. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shera. Yes. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Yes. That is proved in second reading as well. Now we come to 18167 in order to authorize gift acceptance from Eversource for Culvert on Park Hill Road. Second. <laughs> Made and second. Any discussion? Uh, roll call. Councilor Shara? Yes. Councilor Bidwell? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Lavard? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Nash? Yes. Uh, that is approved. Oh, yes. Yeah, that is approved. <laughs> uh, now, ordinances. We have three which have not yet been referred. The first is 18172, an ordinance relative to parking on Union Street. Um, it looks like this already received the positive recommendation from Transportation Parking, so it doesn't need to go back. Is that correct? That is correct. Mr. Chairman, okay. Um, so I assume that can be... I, do I hear a motion to refer to legislative matters? Move so, to refer to legislative second. Matters. Okay, made and second. Any discussion on the referral? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? So that matters referred. Um, now, 18173, an ordinance to amend Chapter 312 36 of the code book. Um, that is also, given the 312, that's also parking, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That's King Street. Is that correct? Increasing the. Oh, no. Well, that's the that's meter. Street. That's price, the yeah. garage. Okay. So this is to change the fees in the gay garage? Okay. Uh, so this has not gone to transportation parking. Is it? Okay. So do I hear a motion? Uh, move to refer to transportation parking. Second. And legislative and matters. Legislative Senate matters, yes. Okay. Uh, great. Uh, and made and seconded. Any other discussion? All those in favor of the referral, please say aye. Aye. Any, aye. Any abstentions? So that is referred. Um, now, 18174, an ordinance to amend chapter 350-12.3. Uh, um, this sounds like zoning. You betcha. Uh, significant trees. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Come back to haunt me. Um, but this is zoning, so it sounds appropriate to have a motion to refer to legislative matters and the planning board. Um, unless the planning is seen it already. Council? I just had a question before we refer. Go right ahead. Uh, 350-12.3 of the code book, but there's also a second ordinance pertaining to uh, 350-11.5. I couldn't understand the relationship between the two. And, mm. and, and um, are these two separate ordinances? They are how two separate ordinances. I'm not sure how they got put on. They were bundled together. I'm not sure okay. why they, how they kind of so got The intention was not to deal with them as one. But no, no. no. Um, that's how they got listed on the agenda. Yeah. Yeah, so... Oh, maybe it's good. Separate chapters, yeah. but they were, I mean, they were submitted and voted yeah. on together by the tree commission and submitted yep. by yep. me. Yep. So. Okay. Good catch. Unfortunately, I feel that whereas 18.174 in ordinance to amend chapter 350-12.3 has been listed on the agenda, the other one has not been duly listed. 
so I wouldn't feel comfortable acting on it, unfortunately. Um, so for better or for worse, we can correct it at our next meeting to get it moving along. Um, so, all right, good catch again. So a uh, motion to refer just the one, which is 18174, to amend 350.12.3 uh, to planning and legislative matters. I don't know such so a motion moved. by Councilor Dwight. It's a second. Second. Second by Councilor Scherer. Any discussion on the referral? Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? So that's referred. And we will make a note to add the other to the two weeks from tonight. Okay, great. Um, now, ordinances that we can take action on. Uh, 18137, ordinance relative to parking on King Street. It's the first reading. Um, I'll just read it. Um, it's pretty brief. Do we have a map of it as well? Yeah. Yeah, there's yeah. a map. Oh, exciting. Okay. Um, blah, blah, blah. This has received a positive recommendation of transportation parking. It was referred to legislative matters, but I assume it's come back. Yep. Mm -hmm. it has, yeah. So okay. Um, recommendation. Yep. This is one of those where I could read the numbers, but basically on King Street on the northeasterly side, um, it looks like it's adding a 15-minute space, uh, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Saturday, um, for approximately 20 feet somewhere northwesterly of Merrick Lane. Yeah. So it's in front of Sutter Meat. Meat or in Cooperative okay. Bank Sutter Meat in there. Okay. So can we have a full description from? <clears throat> Transportation parking. Well, I think you kind of summed it up there. Okay. Um, at one point, there was, I believe, there was a request for two spaces here, and that um, that it got narrowed down to one. And um, <coughs> at the TPC, and was sent forward to council, and then referred back to legislative matters. And mm -hmm. Here we are. Okay. Is there anything you want? <laughs> and. And the purpose is just, oh, okay. Oh, no, this is, um, oh, this is way up from Merrick Lane. This yeah. is for Sutter Meats, as you just said. Yeah, in front of this Sutter Meats. Councillor Shara brought this up, I think. Um, I just want to, I feel like there's been, this has been said a few times. Um, there, there may, the, uh, the owner of Sutter Meats had at one point had maybe asked for two, but I don't think that it ever was requested by a committee to have two. Um, this has been kicking around for a very long time. Um, and I'll just add a little context to it. There is a parking, there's a parking lot behind that building, but there is now um, a studio next door pure bar that when people come in and take an exercise class there, they fill up that parking lot. And, um, and so Sutter Meats has requested this space because they have a lot of people who just want to pop in, buy something, and then leave and have a really hard time finding parking there. We also don't have another 15 minute spot until I believe we get down to where the um, the dog the dog spot the dog spot is the so, one spot at the, at the dog Goggins spot. one too right no there wasn't one there no is there not no oh we closed yeah. the curb cut but no yeah. 15 minutes. right so this would just be the second 15 minute spot okay that's right great so having thank you so having said that do we have a motion on this to approve in first reading uh, so moved if not and seconded second. by Council Labarge any further discussion uh, roll call on this ordinance please. Council yes. Council yes. 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 That is approved. Then we move to another parking ordinance, 18138, or is relevant to parking on Adair Place. Um, this adds a parking prohibition on Adair Place on the northwesterly side from Prospect Street to a point 60 feet northeasterly from Adair Place. Um, a motion to approve this purpose of the so motion. moved to approve. made and uh, so uh mr chairman would you mind all right i'll try summarizing all right, all right. so um <laughs> as sometimes happens these days more often than not uh, somebody noticed on the street noticed the signs were faded and needed to be replaced and dpw came out and noticed that the signs were not posting what was in city ordinance and so they proceeded to put what was in ordinance on the street and the residents were um, their request was hold it we'd like it to remain the way it was so what you're what you see in the proposed side is actually what used to be there <laughs> and so uh, that um, and I, you know, I also want to say that um, 
you know, that we've talked about coming up with some sort of standard for how we we approach uh, the ends the the ends of streets like this as they intersect with uh, main streets, um, and um, that in the TPC when we have these discussions, there's we're we're, um, we're always looking at for some wiggle room because the circumstances change from one situation to the other and in this this is one situation you know we we've talked about vernon street and um and other streets like that in this situation we uh the tpc arrived at you know that the original layout for parking here was the way to go and we wanted to return to that mm -hmm. thank you council chair um just to sort of continue with that what we this councilor nash is right that we're sort of this is coming up a lot and um it's 20 feet there's no parking 20 feet from where the street is to um down to whatever is that cross street prospect well in this instance yeah right. so from prospect to adair but just in general our code calls for 20 feet of no parking but they're all different because our tree belts are different widths, our sidewalks are different widths. So 20 feet on one street um, could be a, a significant amount where there's no parking. And then on other places, it's just, there's very small space and you have, then you have cars that are parking right where um, the intersection is. So that's, that's sort of right. something that we're finding a lot. And so this is one of these instances where 20 feet um, really didn't feel like much because there was a wide tree belt and a wide sidewalk. But I have a question about that because isn't that ordinance directed at drivers, not directed at the city in terms of how we set up parking spaces? Like we could create parking spaces <coughs> by ordinance that are closer than 20. Um, so it's sort of like in the absence of any other parking ordinance. Is that correct? Or? I, I <laughs> guess so. Okay. Yeah. But your point is it's generally good practice to not set up parking spaces more than 20 feet less than 20 closer feet. than 20 <laughs> Le yeah, yeah right yeah. um <clears throat> and that for different streets that that feels and looks different and that it can make it hard for people turning into a street or turning or pulling out from a street if there's cars parked right there okay. but it doesn't feel consistent got it thank you so counselor yeah. yeah and in this case if we went by the the 20 foot rule mm -hmm. because there's such a wide tree belt on prospect mm -hmm that we'd actually, the parking spaces would be starting right about at the sidewalk mm. on, on Prospect. Mm. Yeah. So, um, and, and I think there's a bit of a similar situation going on at Vernon mm. as we're figuring that one out. So. Um, okay, Councilor Dwight. The, uh, it's worth noting that this is, as we said, this is, becomes more common as we actually try to codify all these things. Um, you know, I presume that this original no parking sign that got faded that they, the neighborhood would like to see replaced was a legacy of back when counselors basically got a cranky phone call and they said, fine, go plant a sign, we'll do it. And that's it. There was no ordinance that was applied to it. There was no, there was no community discussion. There was no neighborhood participation. Sign, you woke up one morning, something there was no parking there. Also, it's worth noting, if you look at the picture, that there's somebody illegally parked already in the existing standard and law. So, but uh, that's, we'll try and identify them and tag Sumar, them. the drone right. that took this picture. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Remove the car. Yeah. Okay. Um, one thing, I think, I think the ordinance is incorrectly written. Um, I think it should say in the, in the fourth column, a point 60 feet northeasterly from Prospect Street. In other words, we can put the map yes. on the. Uh, you're right. I think you're right. <clears throat> so, in other words, the way we write these things is it happens yeah, yeah. on yeah. their place yeah. on that side from Prospect Street to 60 Point North yes. Easley. Right. Yeah, no, right. that's correct. Good. Okay. That's so, correct, isn't it? What's that? <clears throat> isn't that correct? It, yes, says, it says from a dare place, and it which is the street you're on already. So it's. It says mine says from Prospect to a point sixty feet northeasterly from. Oh, I see. From I see. Prospect Street. It should be. <coughs> Catch. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. So we've done this before. Yeah. Um, so I move we change it to Prospect Street. I'd like to move. Yeah. Okay. Then I'll second that amendment. Okay. Good. Any discussion? The amendment. Just one question about it. Is it? Are we sure that it's not just meaning from? 
the street sign there. Oh, I don't have the map up. You know, I, I just wouldn't want to go ahead and change it if it hadn't already been. Um. So from Adair Place, well, it's actually from the intersection of Adair Place and Prospect. Right. Right. So it's it from Prospect. The same spot. The picture on the right, prospect. down on the bottom, mm -hmm. of the is that Adair, well, it's Prospect Street on one side, it's Adair Place on the other side. Yeah. Adair has the red line. It's a prospect along the bottom, and then it's Adair. Uh -huh. So from the beginning of Adair Place, it goes up 60 feet. Exactly. I think is the way how it's written, and so we're just questioning whether that's accurate. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm sure if we pulled up the code of ordinances and we saw an adjacent row mm -hmm. for the other side of the street, mm -hmm. we'd see something of the same form. Um, you know, a point whatever looks like three times mm -hmm. the 60. I'm sure it would be from Prospect Street. Because you okay. can't measure something from itself. No. Okay. Mm -hmm. I can see it's cute. Okay. However, I would request that maybe we check with DPW if it's a concern, just to make sure if we can change on second reading if, if necessary. But I think this will be proper. Um, so there's an amendment. So we have an amendment on the floor. Any further discussion amendment? All those favor of the amendment, please say aye. 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 Same session. So that's approved. Any <clears throat> further discussion on the substance of the ordinance? So we're ready to take a roll call vote. Uh-oh. Councillor Carney. <laughs> yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Yes. Councillor Yes. Yes. Okay, so that is approved in first reading. Thank you. Um, so now we have um, just two more items, and we're, then we're done for the night. 18146, an ordinance to amend Chapter 153. Cemeteries. Um, is there any desire for, to waive reading on this for an explanation, or shall I read into the record? Um, can someone explain it? Well, actually, I would defer to Councilor Nash again. Actually, this is. Uh, no, it was just, um, this is. But it was it was a project that Councilor Nash is, uh, was the impetus for the establishment of this change. In there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> No? Okay. I won't say that. No, I, I'd give full credit to could I, to uh, Fred Zimnock, who in right. discussions with um, with the mayor, the uh, Ward 3 meet, had, meets with the mayor once a month, and Fred was had gone through this particular language and pointed out an inconsistency, and the mayor spoke to the solicitor, and thus we have this change. We've corrected this here. So... Mr. May, do you want to provide any further yeah, explanation, it, just uh, general? It, it, it's correct. Fred um, did point out a, an issue. Well, there were many issues with the ordinance. I mean, the, the um, it was written at a time, it still referred to the Board of Public Works, for example, um, and it still, um, it had a lot of regulations in it that are more appropriately done. I mean, the ordinance, if you look at the old ordinance, it was long, and it got into granular detail about how burials would be conducted and all you know all level of detail like that but the other the issue that was fred was concerned about as we were planning to do our capital um improvement spending was the how the actual trust fund monies were withdrawn and spent um and so um, it, it again it invited us to go back and look at those and so what you have now um more closely as aligns this is one of the by because of Mass General Law, cemetery trust funds require an ordinance for this fiscal policy. It doesn't require it for other other trust funds, for scholarship funds, et cetera. So um, this basically aligns with our investment policies and our withdrawal policies for all of our other accounts that we that the treasurer manages. Um, and it's a much more conservative um, you know, given the times that we live in, very few people are taking six percent. I think I think the old ordinance said six or seven percent or something, um, and so um, so this is more in line with that. And then all of the other stuff that's regulatory has been deleted because there's actually um, DPW regulations for cemeteries which are on their website, which um, supersede that. And under the charter and under, um, you know, the, the new form of government, those are more correctly the purview of the departments to carry out. So, so if you're watching Fred, thank you. Yeah. Took a while, but he was definitely the uh, not to 
not to diminish your role in, in it. It was Fred. <laughs> yeah. It was Fred. It was Fred. Councilor, do you have something? Aren't you, that, 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 that'll make sense, but aren't we accustomed when we look at an ordinance that re, re, amends or replaces old language to at least see the old language that's being replaced? I mean, in other words, the, the, the entire thing is being thrown out and replaced with this. So we don't need to worry about what was there because you just explained it and this is fine. Yeah. We just, it was going to be such a long ordinance with a ton of cross throughs that it just seemed cleaner <clears throat> to, re to rewrite what we thought the ordinance should be if we were writing it today and just deleting and replacing. Fair enough. Council. Yeah. But a lot of, a lot of what was in the ordinance has been replaced Had by DPW regulations. Yeah. So that's why the whole thing got thrown out because most of it is in DPW now. We just did Not something anywhere. similar. I can't remember <clears throat> what it was, but we did something very similar to this recently too. Um, because I remember that you wanted to see the copy of the regulations. I just can't remember. Oh, it was, uh, it was sewer sports. regulations. Yeah. Sewer, yeah. yeah, we had sewer regulations yeah. on the books, uh, right. regulations right. that were DEP was using and EPA was referring to, and then we had an old sewer ordinance on the books. So we had these two yeah. conflicting things. So we deleted it completely in that case, and um, and so that the regulation would be the only one standing. So great. Yeah. Yeah, it seems very straightforward to me. So mm -hmm. great. Any other discussion? We have a motion on this, do we not? Not yet. Oh, so move then. Second. Beautiful. No further discussion. Uh, roll call. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Donald. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Yes. Okay, proved on, on first reading. Now, the final one is 18152 in order to amend <coughs> Chapter 9 of the Code of Ordinances by adding uh, Sections 9-1 and 9-2. I will read this, if you don't mind, because I think it's important and I think it will explain it most efficiently. Uh, it's upon the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narkowitz, an ordinance to, as I just said, um, be ordained by the City Council of the City in Northampton as follows. Um, it's uh, uh, Chapter 9 of the Code of Ordinances of the City shall be amended by adding Chapter 9, so it's adding a whole new chapter. Okay. Two sections. First, 9-1, establishment. A special committee is established to conduct a review of the City Charter to be conducted at 10-year intervals in years ending in a 9 in accordance with Section 10-6 of the City Charter. Uh, section 2, membership and term. A, the special committee shall be comprised of nine members who shall be appointed for a term commencing no earlier than January 1st and no later than July 1st in a year ending in nine. One member shall be a member of the city council appointed by the council president. One member shall be an employee of the executive branch of the city appointed by the mayor. Seven members shall be citizens of the city, one from each ward, appointed by the mayor with the confirmation of the city council in accordance with section 2-10 of the city charter. All members of the special committee shall be registered voters in the city. The special committee shall be under the supervision of the city solicitor. Section B, the special committee shall convene no later than 30 days after its appointment, hold meetings as necessary, and file with the city clerk no later than December 31st of the year ending in nine, a report summarizing the special committee's recommendations with any proposed revisions of the city charter contained therein. Finally, C, the special committee shall dissolve upon submission of its report to the city clerk. So motion to approve this. So moved. Second. second. Made and seconded. So this is a requirement of our city charter that every 10 years, so you can give it information if you want, yeah, every 10 years we have to have a special commission to review the charter and we have to establish an ordinance for that purpose. So that's what this does. That's what you said. Yeah, sorry. Okay. <clears throat> Council. I, I just had one, one, one question. It seems very straightforward. The, the final sentence in 9-2A, the special committee shall be under the supervision of the city solicitor. Is there any reason why we're not saying the special committee shall be staffed by the city solicitor? Is, I mean, it's the commission that actually issues a report. Yeah. Um, I, I, it, un, under I the don't know that it was meant to... I think it was more that the, the, yeah, maybe there's a different term if there's a, if you're concerned about that. I mean, it was more. It just seems you know, it's staffed by gets is closer to the what we mean than under the supervision of. Yeah, or advised by. Or advised by. I'm not really sure. Advised I mean, by. The solicitor, you know, when you do your ordinance review, 
that's required by usually the solicitors involved and with the charter. Right. I think, you know, like when you have legislative matters meetings, right. the solicitors often. So I think it was meant more in that spirit. In practice, it probably wouldn't make any difference, um, but it just seems like advised by sounds a little closer to what. That's fine. Yeah. It isn't supervised. But. Yeah. I think it was more that he would be overseeing, I mean, he would be organizing the meetings and, and bringing information that people well, shall consult with. But actually, we had Councilor Murphy, and then we'll go to Councilor. Oh, no, it's just having, having been <coughs> on the previous one with, this solic with the solicitor, um, he really did crack the whip over us to get us done. We had a, we had a chairperson, yeah. but the solicitor was very much involved in moving us along and making sure we did the work we needed to do because the solicitor had a really good understanding of the scope of what needed to get done. So he wasn't the solicitor at the time, I would just point out. Right. He was still Amherst oh, Town was, Council. Yeah, but he was, he, was, he was a citizen oh, he member. I thought he was. Well, yeah. okay. <laughs> I, I make a suggestion that we change the term to oversight. How's that? And so that, that assumes advice and also helping organize and managing the meeting, but at the same time, um, <coughs> Overseen by. Shall we overseen over, by? Overseen yeah. by. Overseen Special by. committee shall be overseen by. Yeah. 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 Crack works the whip. For me. Or, <laughs> or just Cracking the whip, yes. Or just consult with the special committee shall consult with the city solicitor. Whatever your motion. But I, I think to the uh, the point is, is that actually the solicitor will probably be organizing as well. Um, not necessarily presiding, but providing oversight and then also organizing and helping schedule um, testimony and I mean because let's face it it's the solicitor who's been going through this with a fine-tooth comb and already finding the bumpy spots anyway so I think oversight whatever for I mean we're, we're parsing words and maybe it's not necessary but yeah you, your motion is to change the to overseen uh, by the city solicitor the special committee shall be overseen by the city solicitor I'll second that okay may and second it any discussion on the amendment I think it's a good amendment um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, any abstentions? The amendment is adopted to the order. Councilor Klein, you. There's a question that came up in the legislative matters about this with the seven um, voting residents. Um, if the seven, if we should kind of uh, create language that makes clear that uh, each of those seven members should be from the seven different wards of the city. So I wanted to just ask if that had been considered, if seven was a random number, or if it was. was it is one from, each ward, from each ward. One from each ward. One from yeah. each what? ward. Yeah. Didn't we talk about that in legislative yeah. matters? Oh, I think I recall it. I think we. <coughs> but for me, uh, what we talked about was the fact was that should it specifically say that that ward rep is recommended by the councilor? Yes. That's what right. we talked about. Is yeah. exactly. to say that they one from each ward. Uh, Put forward by the councilor of that to word. the mayor. So what the process word. is to de decide who each of those. And I think what I had asked the counts the solicitor to communicate was that you know when we did the compensation advisory committee, you may remember there were seven members, and we asked each ward. I asked each ward counselor to give me suggestions, and I think I pretty much followed all those suggestions and I think we did the same thing for the charter yeah. review committee as well because we had similarly one person from each ward so I I think I had I think there was some concern about that I would be appointing the, all seven members subject to your approval I mean so you still can turn down everyone that I appoint or you know so I think that I, but I'm not sure if you want to codify it you can although I'm not really sure how you codify that other than saying the mayor shall solicit recommendation, I don't know. I'm not sure. I guess I'm making the pledge to you that I will, you know, I will request and from. And one thing is that is a good policy, and I don't know if things will be totally different in 10 years again. But when the time comes again, yeah. maybe it would be good to codify your policy yeah. in the ordinance. It's it's just that always acknowledging and remembering that the mayor actually has the right to re reject the recommendation. So. Um, we're not mandating that you have to accept the recommendation. Yeah, just uh, that would be the only point right. I would make because otherwise right. you might as well. I might as well just you might as well just write me out of it and right. say that the council will be appointing. Right. Subject you're the, to the, you, you're the appointing authority in this, and yeah. so far as that does give you the flexibility and the option of rejecting uh, a candidate, which can be vetted and debated on the floor, obviously. But 
you have the authority to say, no, I don't think that person's going to work for me. Uh, can you come up with another recommendation? Sure. As opposed to what I'm saying is, as opposed to codifying it and saying that the mayor shall accept the uh, recommendation of the specific ward counselor. Yeah, I could say the mayor shall solicit recommendations right. from each of the ward counselors for. I mean, I think I did it last time because it was like you I wanted you guys to go out and find people in your own wards that you thought were good and send them forward so so whatever whatever however however you want to phrase it to memorialize that that's fine can we can we just say in consultation with the counselor from that ward that's fine I mean with that yeah that's good. Satis so the amendment okay Yes. So, so the amendment would read: one mayor, one member shall, uh, excuse me, seven members shall be citizens of the city, one from each ward appointed by the mayor, um, in, in consultation, consultation with, the with the ward counselor, yeah. and with the confirmation of the city council. So. I'll second that. Okay. okay. Thank you. Any second. discussion on the amendment? Council I'm Carney made it, and Council Dwight seconded. Great. And once we have the amendment kind of transcribed. Actually, we can do it by roll call. Um, any further discussion on the amendment? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? So that amendment is adopted. We have the language? Yes. Okay. okay. Any discussion on the ordinance itself? Did we actually take a vote on an on, on amendment to change to overseen by? We did. Yes. We, we did? Yes. Okay. Yes. Then we're done. Um, I would like to just change the, the title just so it's clear. So people, we often talk about people who follow. <laughs> What's going on in the city council? On, on, I mean, can we can we just change the title to say an ordinance to establish a I, charter review committee? I wholeheartedly agree. That was not that yeah. was not what we we didn't we just submitted the language. It's just how it got logged in. I, so moved. I, Absolutely, I agree with that on that. No. So, so the amendment is yeah. to uh, to change the title to an ordinance to establish a charter review committee. That's right. Very good. So made and seconded. Any discussion? All those very clear. Aye. Aye. Any votes? Any abstentions? Good. So now the or uh, ordinance itself. Any further discussion on that for tonight? Okay. So whenever ready, we have a roll call. Please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councilor Klein. Aye. Uh, Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Councilor Yes. Yes. And I'll I'll say yes too, just for. Just to put a period at the I'm end. Left out. Uh, it's all right. <laughs> so, any new business for tonight? Uh, to adjourn. Second. Second. Close to adjournment. If not, all those in favor, say aye. 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 aye.